Well, hey, 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 it's time for Ask the Tech Guys. I'm Leo Laporte. Our car guy, Sam Abul Samit, will answer a listener question about towing with an EV. Mm, and I am Micah Sargent, and I talk about how I get internet throughout my entire home with Mocha adapters. Is that uh, with chocolate or without? <laughs> with, definitely. With, definitely with chocolate. Plus, we'll talk to a listener who has a tweed-covered antenna <laughs> and says it works great. I'm not kidding. All that coming up and a lot more next on Ask the Tech Guys. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is is twit. This is Ask the Tech Guys with Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte, episode 2015, recorded Sunday, March 10th, 2024. Daddy's got his new yacht. This episode brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Well, hey, hey, hey. Oh, sorry to me to wake you. Woo. It is daylight saving time, and we are here in what to us seems, in our human form, to be an hour early. <laughs> yes. Oh, right. Yes. That's the thing, is that it's different between what we're feeling and what the clock the government has moved, deemed is the case. But we didn't. We, our bodies said no. <sighs> Sigh. That's why I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. Because they no. don't care there. They don't do it the time What change. time even is it this, there? For the first year, it's manana. For the first year ever, they're not going to do the time change. Oh, this is their first year doing yeah. that. <gasps> if if Mexico can eliminate daylight saving time. Surely. Surely we can. Now everybody's saying, well, wait, let's not eliminate daylight saving time. Let's, let's eliminate standard time. Right, keep that's it That's more complicated. It's more complicated because that's, I think that's our official time zone. We'd have to update all the Unix machines. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is the show where we answer your computer questions at 888-724-2884. Yes, uh, that is the phone number you can call while we're doing the show. Uh, if you do call that number during the show and you are brought up on stage, so to speak, you'll want to hit star six on your phone to unmute yourself. Uh, there are other ways to get in touch with us. You can also head to call.twit.tv. That is the URL that you can go on your computer, on your smartphone, and connect to us via Zoom. You'll be brought into a Zoom room where you will wait. Uh, we ask that you look toward the bottom of your UI, the user interface, for a little hand icon. It says raise hand. It's getting too complicated. You click Click or tap on that button to too say, I've got a question. Too complicated. Uh, and then the last way that you can get in touch with us, atg at twit.tv. That's the email where you can send audio, video, or text. Yes. Uh, oh, I don't know. There's so many good AI stories like this one. Palantir wins U.S. Army contract for Battlefield AI. Oh, lovely. It's exactly what we were afraid of. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't we just have uh, folks trying to come together to say, let's not do war stuff? Oh, <laughs> yes. Dozens of top scientists sign effort to prevent AI bioweapons. Oh, Lord. Um, what else is going on in the world? <laughs> uh, you know, it's so de depressing. Oh, more, though, on that. So when they talk about battlefield AI, yeah. were they specifically talking about troop movements? Was it more universal? What are we working with when we talk about battlefield it's AI? It's the Titan ground station. Now that uh, Apple's not doing car project Titan, <laughs> they can choose Titan that's available, yeah. uh, which is designed to access space, high-altitude aerial and terrestrial sensors to provide 
actionable targeting information oh. for enhanced mission command and long range precision fires. Where should I shoot? Is what it's basically. Yeah, Titan stands for Tactical Intelligence Targeting Access Node. So the problem with that, of course, is you're now going to give an AI guns. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, um, because what I mm, okay. What could possibly, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> go wrong. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's the logical extension, says Alex Carp. By the way, Alex Carp used to be a good guy. Uh, now he's a bad guy. He's the uh, he's the uh, CEO, the motor mouth CEO of uh, of uh, Palantir, according to the register. Titan is a logical extension of Maven. You know oh, what Maven is? Good old Maven. That was the one that was going to use machine learning engineering to tell people and objects apart in drone footage, so that you know you don't you blow up objects and not people, or maybe it's the other or way the, around. Yeah, you blow exactly. up people, not objects. It just depends on your goals. This is a hot dog, and this is a human. So that's the one Google on did the not want to participate in. The employees at Google said, hey, we ain't working on Maven. Yeah. And uh, so Google s stopped. But, you know, at Palantir, Peter Thiel's uh, AI venture has no such scruples. I don't know. Um, I mean, it was going to happen. Yeah, it was kind of inevitable. If it wasn't us, it'd be them, right? Yeah. That's why we have atomic bombs. If it wasn't us, it'd be them. And uh, this very there's a similarity uh, to all that. By the way, remember uh, last week? Um, Scott Wilkinson said, oh, speaking of which, I'm a little distra distracted. <laughs> He's got a lot on his mind. I got a lot on my mind. Speaking of which, uh, Sam, I believe Sam coming up. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. But last week it was Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek, who convinced me to buy Blu-ray DVDs in a Blu-ray DVD player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does look really good. Oh, snap. It does. I watched Dune 1 because it's Dune 2. Uh, someday will come out on DVD, and it looked amazing. That's good. I'm glad that it was it worth looked, it. Looked, I mean, it was like night. Is it night and day? It's funny because when you watch streaming UHD, mm -hmm. you kind of get used to it, and it looks really great, right? It looks yeah. really good. But then you put in the Blu-ray <laughs> DVD on on this is on a nice LG. By the way, Dolby Vision. I didn't put it on the Samsung because I wanted to see it in the best light. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Suddenly. It's gorgeous. And that's a the, gorgeous movie. The the scales fell from your eyes. Yes. Like a lizard man. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have to I have to give Scott props because I was being skeptical. Mm -hmm. And uh and it really does it, you know, uh, we were talking about what they call macro blocking, which is artifacts that are added by high compression. And in order to stream it, you compress it much more than you would on a DVD. It's still compressed on a on a disc. It's compressed everywhere because video is big. Uh, the only place you wouldn't see it compressed is if you're watching a film projector in IMAX like Oppenheimer. Right. Uh, or the new Dune 2, if you're lucky enough to be able to get a ticket. They're sold out everywhere. Uh, so the macro blocking gives you a bunch of weird effects, but the most prominent of which is, you know, you're on the, the desert planet Dune, and there's a lot of blue, 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 blue sky. And in streaming, it might like look like there's strips of blue. Like you can't do a perfectly smooth gradient. Like like look more like my socks. And uh, not on the not on the blue. Ooh. Oh no, boy, that was a crisp blue, cerulean sky, for which the sandworms emerged. Um, okay, what else is new? What else is new? I what will be back in two weeks, mm -hmm. so I won't be here next Sunday. Are you doing something special next Sunday? Uh, yeah, hosting the show by myself. All that's by pretty, yourself? That's pretty special. Good man. Good uh, man. No, I like be, it. It'll be a good time. That's bold. Um, that's we've brave. Got, we've got two guests that week, so. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, you, should, you could. You could uh, yeah, I did it twice when you were before. gone last yeah, time, so yeah, yeah, yeah. not a big deal. But um, there was one other story that you Your posted. turn for story. Well, th this I thought was important. It's about Roku. Uh, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of. Wow. Uh, uh, speaking okay. of why I oughta. Uh, so <laughs> Roku is kind of under fire right now by its own customers because of its latest terms of service update. Now, there are some layers to this story. Uh, the terms of service update actually took place quite a while ago. However, they Roku, the company, did not make it apparent to its users that the terms of service were updated until just recently and the way that they the way that it went about doing it was to pop up 
a little notification on the Roku device that said our terms of service have been updated and you need to agree to them, providing an agree button or a learn more button by hitting asterisk, I think it was on the remote. When you hit that learn more button by hitting the asterisk, it would take you to the full terms of service, at which point you could then hit agree. In other words, there was no way to Unagree. anything other than agree. You may not disagree. You may not disagree. Uh, it turned out that for people who actually read through the terms of service, the one way to disagree was by writing a letter <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Roku's lawyer at lawyers and providing all of this information. And it was a lot of information you had to provide. And what is wild is anyone who chose to not agree simply could not use their device from that point. There's Which no way to get past that screen. Maybe not such a big deal if you have a $69 Roku. Uh, but it's a very big deal if you have a Roku TV, right. which many people do because that suddenly means... Your TV won't work you anymore. You can't use your TV. And Roku has not had anything to say about this on last check. You know, it could be that by the time the show publishes, they've got more to say. But all the company said was... <clears throat> Like many companies, Roku updates its terms of service from time to time. When we do, we take <clears> steps <throat> to make sure customers are informed of the change. Yeah, they took steps some like four or five months later. Uh, the, this is, this. by the way, the thing you're agreeing to, most people will just go, yeah, yeah, fine, which is the, the terms of the dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of companies do that. We actually, I confess, we do that. If you decided you didn't like something about me mm -hmm. and you decided to sue i would point out that in your contract it right. says you have to go to arbitration yeah you can't go to a court you have to go to binding arbitration and that's what roku is saying many companies do this legal complaints will be handled through arbitration instead of involving the court system second complaints must be handled through a phone call or in person with roku legal representation even before you go to arbitration in other words you got to you got to talk your way through a lawyer first. Uh, this is very normal. It is normal. Most sure. people will not, you know, will say fine. But we know that you, <laughs> you people will go, what is this I'm agreeing to? And say, try to say no. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. And <laughs> Roku gave, you had to do it within 30 days of first becoming subject to the updated terms. And that was February 20th that those terms became available. So there's not much time to make So that. send them a postal mail letter <laughs> with your name, address, phone number, email address used for your Roku account, device, model number, a receipt if you have it. And you have to mail that to Roku's general counsel in California. Good luck finding his address. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, even if you do that, it's built into the TV. I don't know. What is he yeah. going to come to your house? Yeah, that's Hi, the I'm the general counsel. I've got a screwdriver. Let me just fix that. And until that goes through, how? who knows how long that will take to process. No TV you for you. the TV. <laughs> no TV for you. This is just, but you know what? Most, uh, you know, as ZDNet points out, Reddit requires this. Yeah. Facebook requires this. This is it's very, very common, very common uh, to to want to not go to court, but just go to binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, and I, to be fair, we we do it too. I didn't write the contracts but. with employees, though. I feel like that's different than somebody who's buying a product. You know, what I mean? it's really bad to to sell a TV and then after the fact yeah. change the terms and say if you don't agree to these because you could make it anything. Uh, yeah. Give us your first board. Oh, you don't want to? No TV, <laughs> no TV for, for you. you. Especially because it seems to be uh, in many many times companies do it after there's some concern of a class action lawsuit yeah. that comes into play. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, 23andMe was one company that did that. They after the cyber attack against the company that was was sort of, I won't go into it. We talked about it before. Uh, after that, then they updated their terms of service. Yeah. Well, good, one good thing that they did was, I should I keep saying they, it. One good thing that 23andMe did was it provided a means of just emailing a rejection as opposed to having to send a, a letter. You a should be able letter. to say no to this. Uh, and it really is unconscionable to say, you know, we're going to disable your yeah. product if you don't agree to this. I mean, think there's so many products, you know, you have a refrigerator and and suddenly a company sends you a notice saying, hey, you have to agree not to sue us <laughs> or we're going to disable you. We're going to brick your refrigerator. I mean, this these things, that's not OK. No, it's not. 
The terms you bought the deal, the, in fact, I think the court should weigh on this. The terms that you agreed to when you bought the device should hold. Can you imagine being in a car and having a car do that? You yeah, go to oh, start it way, in the morning. I could see a Tesla doing that. Yeah. You go to start <laughs> in the morning and it's like you have to hit yeah. OK before you can begin. Yeah. We got it. You, you can't, you can't sue us. Nope. Anyway, I'm glad you brought that up because that's very annoying. So, again, 888-724-2884. Email ATG at twit.tv. Zoom us. Call.twit.tv. Do it on your phone. We'll see you. Should we? Let's do a, a call. I feel like I feel, I'm feel i going to go crazy here. I'll be wacky. Whoa. And we're going to take a call. Whoa. We're going to do a call. Uh, all right. I'm going to pick up on John because I think he was trying to call him last week. Yeah, I think, we, I think we had that problem with John. That is, uh, by the way, our esteemed producer. He's a senior producer. Uh, Mr. I went um, from I went from junior to senior. Yeah, he's senior now. John Ashley. Ooh, no, congratulations. no promotion. And by the way, please sign this <laughs> binding arbitration. Sue us. <laughs> oh, I, I need you to send it to uh, my lawyer so I can look it over. <laughs> ah! See, that's what you do. Yep. You say, well, Roku, that's fine. But I think my attorney needs to see this. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Don't agree. That's a great idea. Thank you, John Ashley. The law offices of Wiener and Schnitzel. Uh, actually, hold on one second. John, I need your help. Uh oh, John's got to do something. Uh, Wiener Schnitzel. That's because my lunch is a Wiener Schnitzel sandwich. Would you like to see it? Uh, sure. <laughs> there it is. Whoa! So, just to show no that sprouts. I'm a man of the people. No sprouts. You know, you know why? Because I'm going on vacation. I didn't oh, want to do no, sprouting. That's fair. that's fair. You don't want to sprout too far in advance. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sprout. I read that. They should be fresh. Fresh sprouts. sprouts. How about while we try By the way, to that resolve this thing? Good. Uh, Leo, you there's get some it? emails. Is it an Amazon thing? Instagram, of course. Oh, I, 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 I have a mail. I want one because I, because of you, I bought because I bought some sprouts at the grocery store. Mold. No, no. And this is the problem with sprouts; they go bad very easily if they get slimy, and they could be, and that could be dangerous. So you have to have fresh sprouts. The Sprouter is the greatest. You have to send me a the link. Sprouting Company. The Sprouting Company. That's, that's the name what of it's it. Called? The Sprouting okay. Company. It was a guy who decided to eat raw food. And realize, just like you, you can't get fresh sprouts in the grocery store. You got to make them. You know what? It's so easy to make them. It took four days, and suddenly I have this giant sp sprout sprouts. garden <laughs> in my in my little sprouter. Jet lag is for amateurs. Oh, oh. let's do this one, shall we? Because I have images to go with this one. That's actually, I think, a different email. There's two emails with the I Oh, it is. This is a different jet lag is for amateurs. Long time listener reaching out for the first time. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I have a Wi-Fi question problem. Oh, that's the secret code. Yep. Yes. See, we had two emails with the secret code oh, you decided to give out code. last Works. week. So what was the trick? So if they if they use the secret code, it basically meant that they were watching the show and we didn't get to them. So we gave them a secret code oh, so that they could jump one. the line. This is, thank you, Daniel. So you're jumping the line. Long time listener, long, long time listener reaching out for the first time. Wi-Fi problem. Okay. I own a house with a large metal air conditioner return unit in the middle of the house. This causes any Wi-Fi oh. signal to drop from, from one end to the other like a lot. We no longer have Spectrum Kiwi cable, but good news. He does use Spectrum Internet. Once he tried Mocha 2 about three years ago, but couldn't get to work. I think it was missing the POE filter. Uh huh. Mike, Micah, you mentioned your setup. It sounded great. I think Mocha, which is something over cable, uh, it's coax. media over coax, coax. I think is what they call it. Yeah. So you, when have, many of us have coaxial cable in the walls that was put in either when the house was built or later for cable TV. You know it if you have a little coax thing sticking out of the wall down at the baseboard. Uh, that it turns out goes around the house to many different rooms mm -hmm. enough so that you could use it to spread your uh, Wi-Fi. I still have coax cable. He writes, Daniel writes, in all of my rooms, unused, except for the room with the modem, <laughs> along with three Eero Pro Six units and one Eero Six extender. Boy, I thought I would have thought the Eero would have solved this. Walk me through your setup. Yeah. Okay. So first and foremost, there was already a uh, filter in my house for some reason. I think it might be because I'm connected to other homes. So they probably have a filter on everyone. Because if you don't do that, your internet goes to everywhere else. Yes, that, exactly. Now you're in an apartment, a, a standalone home. Would that still be? A, it, it might be. It could be because th this is the thing about the filter. We're all connected is that at the same point. It works. It, it keeps it from doing the, that system is used for so many purposes. It uh, stops like DVR and other things 
things from interacting. Right. So basically, uh, and these the good thing is these are not very expensive. The uh, actual Mocha uh, filters are like 12 bucks. And you want it on, the way that it's uh, in my home is I went to where the cable was installed. It happens to be in a closet upstairs. And the filter is going from the cable that comes in from outside of the house the filter is on, and then it goes directly into what I have, which is a powered splitter. Uh, originally, there was just a splitter there that was unpowered, yeah, a passive bad. splitter, yeah. and I didn't want that. I wanted the high capacity signal. Yeah. So I bought a uh, powered splitter, and then each of the coaxial cables that comes out of that lead to different parts of the home. And in my office, which is where that splitter is, I have the... Um, the screen beam uh, Mocha adapter, the first one. And what what is going on is the modem, of course, has cable that is coming from uh, directly from outside of the house through that filter into the modem. And then the modem plugs into a network switch, a powered network switch. And one of the Ethernet cables from that powered network switch leads into the back of the Mocha. From there, the other side of the Mocha is the coaxial cable. That coaxial cable runs into the splitter so that it can send its signal to the living room, which has the uh, coaxial port on the wall. From there, coaxial cable connects to the other Mocha adapter and then Ethernet comes out of the other end of that into another powered network switch that provides Ethernet to Apple TV, PlayStation 5, and a few other devices. So I've had no issue once I had the filter. Uh, the one thing I will say is give the, if you tried it and you you maybe gave it 30 minutes or something and you're like, okay, this isn't working, give it some time. I, for some reason, it, it can take a while for it to kind of kick on and figure out what's going on. I think that it does a lot of configuration behind the scenes. And so I did have an issue when I first tried it. I was impatient and thought, oh, this isn't working. And then later I tried it again and it worked just fine. Uh, so yes, get one of those filters. Again, they're not very expensive. If you do, if you type in Mocha filter on Amazon, for example, you'll find them for like 12 bucks. And this is key. You only need one Protecting you One from the filter, outside yeah, world. Exactly. It's not through the rest of the house. Exactly. He said POE, which is power over internet. Uh, sorry, over Ethernet, Ethernet yeah. uh, filter. That I don't... I, I don't, mean, I guess you could use <clears throat> Mocha. I don't know. I don't think you would... Yeah, because if you're doing power... Oh, I see. Power over... E, okay, gotcha. It wouldn't huh. be... Why? How would it get into the cable, though? The yeah, I don't know. I didn't know that you would need POE yeah. filtering. Uh, maybe he's maybe he's confused, but Daniel, yeah, definitely put the filter between you and the outside world. Yes. That's the whole point, right? Exactly. So that your traffic doesn't go out and their traffic doesn't come in. Uh, and and uh, Berkeley, <laughs> Berkeley McQuinn, <laughs> our esteemed studio engineer, says Mocha can be a pain in the butt, but the filter is a hundred percent required for Mocha. The signal voltage is much higher. Hmm. Don't know what that means, but don't, he does. I don't either. Yeah. All I know is it works exceptionally well in my home <laughs> and I've had no issues with it. So, uh, John, uh, are we are we good with the other John or we should we move on? Uh, let's find out. Hey, John, join us in the Stargate and tell us what city you're calling from. There he is. He looks like the Wizard of Oz, doesn't he? Yeah. Pay no attention to the man oh, behind the curtain. We can Hi, you. John. What can we do Hello, for you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, I don't know what happened before. Uh, no, that was something on our end. That was, uh, it was boy producer, John. Ah, uh, I got demoted. Oh, okay. oh, he just got demoted immediately. <laughs> 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 hey, I love that. That's the old Twitch shirt. That's a good looking shirt. Love yeah, that that's shirt. Peter. That's, that comes out of my closet for special occasions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. When okay. I go down to Mexico, I did bring one ZD TV shirt, which I'm going to wear just to see if anybody knows. Nice. Do you, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Uh, John, where are you calling? What city are you calling from? Oh, Cal Calgary. But I'm waiting when I go to the mall one time and somebody walks up to me and says, uh, you know, knows it. But Wouldn't that uh, be cool? Never happens, it does would it? Be. Never, ever okay. happens. Okay. A couple of things. Uh, on our streams, Frank from BritBox, and there, we have another provider. Uh, 
I, I like the closed captioning on, but what happens is the closed captioning captioning slowly gets ahead of the show. Oh, and that's it will, terrible. It is. Yeah. And I just. Uh, <laughs> it just spoils all the surprise. Do. The murderer yeah. is. Oh, no, don't exactly. tell me. Don't tell me. That's right. How so, far ahead does know, it get? Like. It's it's gradual. I don't know. I I get to the point that I have to turn it off and turn it back on, and it resets. But every wow. you know seven or eight minutes. So it's mm-hmm. uh, is it just on? Know, it's on BritBox and whatever. another streamer, or is it on all? It's only on those streamers. Yeah, it seems to be a BritBox. So what's the other one? I've had this happen Acorn. too, John. Yeah. Um, Acorn. Yeah. So there are some streamer. The, the so what's happening? Uh, in almost every case, it has to do with audio sync. Um, your audio is is being slightly adjusted. Uh, the sync of the audio is being slightly adjusted so that it comes out of the speakers at the proper time to match with the voices or with the mouths moving on screen. And this is something that's happening in the background. But those captions or subtitles are hard coded to fire at a certain time. And so okay. that's why turning it off and turning it back on again sometimes uh, fixes it because it kind of picks it up from the sink, if that makes sense. Reboots it kind of in a yeah. way. Yeah. Um, I have had this issue because I'm a person who I watch everything with captions or subtitles always. And unfortunately, I have yet to find a solution that 100% works other right. than... Uh, and I'm curious to hear, uh, what is your audio setup? Do you just listen to the speakers that come from the television itself? Do you have... That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So so that's interesting because that should, in theory, cause the fewest issues with this. Like the, the sync should not be that off. This is kind of a, a general problem uh, that has to do with... You, you, you kind of referred to time code. Normally... In a in a well, if Alex Lindsay were doing it, <laughs> there would be time code for the video and time code for the audio, and you would and they and that the system would always say, oh, "Well, I'm not going to play the audio till the right time." Mm-hmm. But they're right. Se- if they're separate streams and they are not in sync, they're not time coded, then this yeah. happens. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. The only no, thing I, I, you no. might try sometimes, I don't know if this is the case on uh, your system, on my system, I have multiple English closed captions there's one called sdh uh-huh. and there's one called cc mm-hmm. no and, not that i can okay think you might look and okay. see sometimes it's in the tv sometimes it's in the stream but l- you might see if there's other options for uh, closed captioning it might be that some of them are better than others yeah and it only seems to be on certain streams which isn't uh, that interesting yeah to, but i, I, I love brick box even- what show do you yeah, like I- to watch Oh, we like to watch, uh, we love Father... Father Brown. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's and, the one Ian yeah. Thompson says is the, is, you got to watch, yeah. yeah. Right. Summer Murders. Mids, my wife's piping in here. I hear the other one? I love uh, those too. Doc, Dr. Dr. Oh, Dr. Martin. Dr. Oh, Martin. I love, love Doc Dr. Martin, not the shoes, but the, <laughs> but the Doc yeah. Martin. Yeah, he's in a, he's a big city doctor who goes to a small village and it's, it's typical British fare. It reminds yeah, me of yeah, all yeah. creatures great and small where it's yeah. Doc Martin is my hero. Yeah. I love him. He's like, <laughs> he's like, it's like, like a, a small town with very small town problems, which makes you feel good because they don't have the big global problems. We all suffer. That's right. And it's and just some wonderful. Of the crime shows. Yeah. yeah. I'll have one more quick thing. I phoned or called in a few weeks ago when you were away, Leo, about, uh, 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 the audio on uh, TV about having wearing headphones and being able to yeah. uh, listen. Well, my wife also listens to the speakers on the TV, and I don't know if Micah remembers, but it was to do with my DVR and Bluetooth. And I don't know if you'd ever heard of it, but I I, I tell my DVR to go to Bluetooth, and then it can uh, you know connect to my Bluetooth speakers, and I could hear the show through there. And my wife can also hear the show through the speakers on the TV. And I know you've had that call several times, and you know, you've thought of all sorts of gadgets. And uh, so this is a multi-role, multi-role of VCR. So, so if somebody has that and they're having that issue, they should just, well, we could talk to ours, but find the Bluetooth and hook it up to the Bluetooth headphones and you have your own volume and own audio through the headphones. Yeah, it's pretty cool that uh, it's built in, that it gives you that functionality. Um, right. To to. Because that's not something that I think is front of mind for a lot of the companies that are making those. So to be able to provide Bluetooth for the audio at the same time that it's also outputting audio exactly, to the without speakers. without cutting out the other. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. very cool. 
Right. You yeah, reminded me because we had this call and somebody sent me or came on later and gave us a link for a new generation. I think it might have been from Avantry. I can't remember of uh, Bluetooth uh, TV headphones that were using the a newer, a better technology for syncing. And I even ordered them for my mom. And now I'm remembering that I don't think they ever came. No, so okay. I yeah. think it was one of those, uh, you know, or pre-orders. So I'm sure I didn't get charged, but I'll keep right. my eye peeled. If I can remember the name and maybe somebody in our discord will remember it because yeah. we were talking so about this I'm, before, I, but you're, you know, you're like, satisfied. Like, you're happy with your solution. You've, you've oh, found, absolutely. Yeah. It, it didn't yeah. involve, uh, you know, buying any, uh, other, you know, technology. So it, yeah, it right. works. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's nice if you have that set up. Sometimes, by the way, that's when you do get lip sync issues because Bluetooth is a little bit slower. But you're not. Yeah, see, there not might be that. a slight, but it's not nothing like that close nice. close caption. My wife just popped in "Death in Paradise" for BritBox. Ah, "Death in Paradise." Yeah. That sounds like a Hercule Poirot kind of a murder yeah, mystery. Yeah. yeah. And, well, we have Poirot. We watched all Poirot. I love but all anyways, the Poirots and all the We're off topic Christine. here and I just want to thank you, gentlemen. I, I know that you were away when uh, Mike and I discussed that thank before. You, and it, uh, yeah. You know, I hope maybe I can save a couple of marriages. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and Scooter X in our Discord sent us, there is a Reddit subreddit called oh. Britbox uh, slash oh, okay. r slash Britbox. And here's from seven months ago, Britbox is truly lame subtitles. Oh, I'll um, look it up. Yeah, uh, it sounds like more that he doesn't like the quality of the subtitles. Yeah, yeah. than the well, uh, I know the I'm having a problem. You know, of the millions of people that watch, I'm not the only one. You know, so it's yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah. If, and as I said, yeah, I've had it happen before too, and I have to turn them off, and suddenly I don't know what anyone's yeah. saying anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's funny. The other day I saw, I I noticed that they were getting ahead of the. Video and I, I didn't think. And when I'm watching a it. comedy, that's really frustrating because it does end up spoiling the joke for me. And sometimes right. I'll just close my eyes and listen. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's totally so, so when are you fellows getting up to the Calgary Stampede? Oh, I'd love to. Gosh, would I love to? I've yeah, got a cowboy yeah, hat and boots all ready to go. Yeah, I well, remember when I was a kid, my my folks went, and it made me jealous. So every yeah. year, what 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 time, when is the stampede? Uh, this it year? starts about the first uh, first Monday of July for ten days. First Friday of July. My all my right. luckily my helps here. First Friday <laughs> of July, you know, for ten days. My yeah. wife and I will have to make plans because I've always I wanted it's it's the rodeo. Uh, every, you well, know, the greatest outdoor show on earth. They call it. You know, yeah, that might yeah, be it's the one to go to. Wow, yeah. I think yeah. I have some friends yeah. in Calgary actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, I'll check John. That out. Bye, Mrs. Okay, John. Bye. Yeah, bye. See <laughs> the Calgary Jam P Stampede, July fifth through fourteenth. Wow, have... there's music, there's there's rodeo, there's night shows. Oh, we definitely have to go. To this there's An a auction. canvas auction. General, can, it's the canvas auction. I don't know what they're auctioning. What it? Okay, the canvas. Obviously. The canvas. Shaky Graves. It could be oh, art. That. Oh, Shaky Graves is really good. The Jonas Brothers. Oh, I don't care about that. Miranda Lambert. Wow, wrestling! Wait, they're doing There's wrestling. Will they be wrestling uh, the Stampede? Motley Crew, the Saints of Los Angeles. Wow, uh, introducing the campy, the poster. This looks like something to go to. You don't want to go to Calgary in the winter. No, no. But in the summer, it's nothing nicer. We were watching a show the other day, and it had it was profane in words. <laughs> the, the, there were lots of profanity. What did the subtitles do? This is what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. I was a little perturbed and bothered, bothered, if you will, yes. by the fact that the captions were completely sanitized. I think that that Did they is- they put a, asterisks in? Not even asterisks. They changed what the people oh, were saying. Like so when someone was called a, you know, though this person's a blah, 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 it said, this person's a real jerk. <laughs> and I'll just tell you, it was a Quentin Tarantino film. Oh, that ruins it. And- You can't have- I think that that's- not I, I didn't care because I can hear it, but yeah. for the people who are watching it who cannot hear what they're saying, I th that's not a choice that should be made on behalf of the people who are watching it who can't hear it, I feel. Yeah. That's not cool. That is bizarre. Yeah. Maybe you had the, the Christian sub. Yeah, I must have. Yeah, I must have chosen they, Christian sub. There are subtitles. other ones, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I, we were watching it via Apple TV, and I was wondering. I if, think Apple does some. Uh, if Apple was doing the captions there. Yeah, the old time term is bowdlerizing. You remember oh. that phrase? Bowdlerizing. Bowdlerizing. 
Uh, it was from a, a very famous Reverend uh, Bowdler, I guess would be his name. And uh, he didn't like bad words. And so they Bowdlerized them. Uh, let us take a tiny little break and we will uh, continue on with more of your calls. Samable Sam at the Car Guy coming up in just a little bit. Uh, you're watching Ask the Tech Guys with Micah and Leo. Our show today brought to you by Delete Me. It happened again. Did you get the text from yeah, Lisa? Yeah, I did. From Lisa. This time, though, it wasn't effective. It wasn't nearly as effective because it didn't come from her phone number. Yeah. There was information missing. Delete Me is really working. So this is this is why every company needs to have Delete Me for their executives, for their managers, anybody with direct reports. Periodically, bad guys try to send text messages purporting to be from our CEO. So what did it ask for this time? Amazon gift cards? Uh, I think it was Apple gift cards. It says, oh, it's an emergency we need Apple gift cards, and I'm in a meeting, so please order some for me and send it to this address. <laughs> okay, Lisa. All right, boss. Now, there are probably some companies with that would work, but didn't work with ours. It's why we immediately, that when this happened first, uh, signed up for Delete Me. And I have to say, it's really been getting better. The problem is the bad guys can go to data brokers and get your phone number. They can easily spoof it. Your direct reports, your company's you know, org chart, all of that. And then do these very effective uh, phishing expeditions. They call it spear phishing. If you've ever searched for your name online, you probably know what I'm talking about. You, there is so much personal information about every one of us online, thanks to those icky data brokers. Delete Me helps reduce the risk, not just from cybersecurity threats and spear phishing, but from identity theft, credit card fraud, robocalls. You get a few robocalls these mm -hmm. days, harassment. Just unwanted communications overall. The first thing you do is, and this is what we did immediately, you go, you sign up, and you submit some basic personal information. They need to know things like your birth date and stuff so they can know what to look for, right? Delete Me experts will find and remove your personal information from hundreds of data brokers, helping reduce your online footprint, keeping you, your family, your company safe. But they don't stop there. And this is very important because... The data brokers all have to, thanks to GDPR, have a form to remove the data. What they don't tell you is, but that doesn't mean we won't repopulate it the minute we get more information about you. They rebuild those dossiers. So Delete Me will continue to scan and remove your personal information regularly. Addresses, photos, emails, relatives, phone numbers, social media, property value. It just goes on and on. They also have privacy advisors because different people have different threat models. Uh, different privacy exposure issues. So they'll help you understand what's happening and give you the support you need. Protect yourself. Reclaim your privacy. This really works. We've been using it for now two years. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. Use the code twit. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. The code twit for 20% off. You just, and you got to keep doing it because they come back. They're like cockroaches. <sighs> Join Delete Me. They're the exterminators. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. Don't forget the offer code twit. Thank you, Join Delete Me. Uh, let's do one more uh, fun little uh, question and answers. How about a, another email? All righty. Is this going to also say? Let's no. See. <laughs> Help mom to text cross-platform family members. Let me guess. Is mom a green bubble? Mom. This is from Melissa. Hi, Micah and Leo. Longtime lover of all things Twit. Oh. And Twit Club member here. Thank, Thank you, you, Melissa. Uh, text messages from my mom's Apple device don't seem to always go to my brother's Android phone. He, or vice versa. He sends a message from his iPad. Subsequent messages from mom go to his iPad, but they don't go to his phone. I bet you know what's going on. Yeah. So remind me, mom's on an iPhone? Mom's on an iPhone. Brother has an Android phone, but an iPad. Yeah. So he has both, right? He's yeah. Apple and Android. This is the part that's uh, troublesome. Basically, when he is sending a message from his iPad to mom, it is going via iMessage. And it is using iMessage. Not the phone system. Not the phone just system. Just data. Yes. And when that's happening, if brother has his phone number as part of his iMessage 
set up on the iPad, if he's put that in, then when brother uses that to send to mom and when mom, more importantly, when mom responds, it kind of temporarily locks that phone number into uh, iMessage. That's what she says. We try to create two threads, one for his Android phone and the other to his iPad, but Apple keeps it combining keeps trying them. trying to make it smart and link the two together. Because it sees his Apple account and says, oh, no, no, he's, he's an Apple exactly. guy. Exactly. So what I would recommend doing is in... All, on all of the devices that are uh, iOS or, or Mac or whatever, you can go into messages on, in your settings and you can go to a section called send and receive. And what you want to do and what brother wants to do in this case is on the iPad, brother wants to make sure that in there, there are two sections in send and receive. You can receive iMessages to and reply from. Oh. And then there's a section called start new conversations from. On both of those, brother wants to make sure that the phone number is not selected, that instead the brother's Apple ID is the email that is selected in both of those cases. That will stop iMessage from trying to default to the phone number because it likes to default to a phone number. And that but wait, she wants she wants it to go to his phone number too. She yes, she wants to be able to text the phone number. Yeah. But when when she is it's merging it, that into the exactly. Apple account. And so that So there isn't a way for her from her iPhone to send to both the iPad and the at Android the same phone. time, no, no. So it's either going to go one or the yes. other. If you take the phone number out, it'll always go to the iPad, but not the Android device, unless she texts him to his phone number specifically. So what? So she, she can to text the phone number specifically. Yes. There's one additional thing you want to make sure in the contact list mm -hmm. that the phone number doesn't say iPhone next right, to it. Correct. Because that tells Apple, oh, good. This is I smush it all I together. Yeah. So yeah, basically, mom is going to have to create kind of a new thread that's to his iCloud email and make that the way that she talks to him via the iPad. And then the phone number will go back to just being Android on its own. So unfortunately, and she says, you know, my mom's 84. We, you know, I know you're going to say use WhatsApp or something else. No. But uh, she says it's hard to get mom to use new apps. Yeah, I don't. And my brother doesn't want another messaging app. <laughs> I don't think it has to be another messaging app. I think, honestly, what I would recommend is uh, having your brother just choose to use the phone number. And then on the iPad, uh, you can use what's called text message forwarding. And so once again, in settings and in messages, there is a section called text message forwarding, forwarding, excuse me. And your brother will want to toggle this on for the iPad. And that allows for, well, no, because you have to have an iPhone to do that. So no, that's not going to work because it, if the primary device was an iPhone and the secondary device was an Android, that would be much easier. But yeah, it's, it's kind of messy. Yeah. And on the, I understand why Apple is doing this because they're saying, well, if everyone would just use Apple <laughs> devices, all of this would really be nice and seamless, mm -hmm. right? You'd, you'd message the iPad and it would go to his iPhone and vice versa. And and uh, and they don't have a good response for, but I want to use an Android phone. Yeah, their response is, "We'll get an iPhone." Literally, that's what Tim Cook said to something similar. Well, she should just get an iPhone. I think your brother just needs to stop messaging from the iPad, uh, like to to mom. I think that's the other option. Yeah. Is just not use the iPad at all for yeah. messaging. Exactly. Uh, and use your Android phone. Apple will understand, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to use SMS to reach him. Exactly. And then that way you're able to text back and forth. But the second you get the iPad involved, it tells Apple's servers that now this is the way that you're trying to communicate. And Apple is, of course, going to default to iMessage. So that's why it keeps going to the iPad and not reaching you on your Android device. Somebody asked uh, the AI, you know, we have an AI Leo in our Club Twit Discord. By the way, Melissa, thank you for your very kind yes. words. And I, I'm not going to say what it is, but I love your Gmail address because she has, you know, you have to have a unique address. Everybody uses Gmail. She has very cleverly encoded her name. Nice. And I believe, Melissa, if I'm not wrong, your state into your address, which makes it easy to remember. But it's not obvious. But, you know, I like puzzles. Our AI Leo, who also likes puzzles... One of our uh, Discord chatters, this is, by the way, one of the benefits of Club Twit, you get to talk to my artificial intelligence, asked it, 
AI Leo, how did you forget about daylight saving time? It, it announced our show an hour late. Aren't you supposed to know everything? And then AI Leo says, ah, daylight saving time. The bane of my existence is like trying to keep up with a squirrel on a caffeine high. <laughs> Sometimes even us all-knowing AIs need a little reminder now and then. But hey, at least I can still tell you the best time to binge watch your favorite tech shows, right? <laughs> How did it get such personality? I don't know. It's got so much personality. It's kind of scary. We're getting this close to be uh, me <laughs> permanently living in Cabo San Lucas and letting <laughs> the AI join you for the show. Is it time for I my I favorite? I can ask it a Linux question. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, go ahead. You know what? They do that, by the way. They're 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 constantly teasing uh, the AI Leo, which is okay. It's just a machine. Sam Abul Samet is a principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's also the host of a wonderful podcast called Wheel Bearings, uh, and he uh, is a regular on, on not just this show, but on all of our shows. Uh, in fact, he was on Twitch just last week. And Roberto Baldwin, his co-host on uh, Wheel Bearings, is going to be on today. In fact, I think Ooh. he's coming up today which will be a lot he's not he changed his mind oh, <laughs> oh he, you didn't get the memo john okay i last i heard roberto was coming but that's all right bobby as they call him hi sam robbie bobby hey leo hey you've, micah you've got a rivian r2 behind you i do yes did you drive it no nobody's driven it yet yeah um it's it's still two years away from production oh. uh so for for those for those uh, not aware, um, on Thursday, uh, so what uh, two three days ago now, Rivian held an event um, down in Southern California to reveal their next vehicles, their follow ups to the R1. So right now, they Rivian has three vehicles in production. They have the R1T pickup truck, um, the R1S, which is an SUV version of that. It's a three row SUV. And um, their delivery van, uh, which is there are currently several thousand of those in use by Amazon, uh, including by uh, my local Amazon warehouse here. And we see those quietly uh, rolling through our neighborhood on an almost daily basis. Yes. Um, they have that and, same headlight. Yes, oh. they do. Yep. Same, same basic design. Oh, um, that's cool. So um, they revealed uh, their next couple of vehicles. Uh, starting with the R2, uh, and during the teasers in the run-up over the last couple of weeks to the event, you know they they just teased R2. Everybody knew they were going to do an R2, um, and this is a smaller SUV um, than the R1 series um, SUV only, no pickup truck for now. Uh, and so this one, the 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 R3 is about the size of a uh, a three-row Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's a three-row SUV, electric SUV. Uh, the R2 is a little bit smaller. It's about the same, roughly the same overall length and width as the Jeep Wrangler, uh, as well as the upcoming Jeep Recon, which is launching later this year, which is Jeep's first electric off-roader. Um, and um, the R2 is is similar size class, uh, and it's going to be substantial. Well, the plan is for it to be substantially more affordable than the R1s. The R1s start in the mid seventy thousand dollar range. The R2, uh, when it goes on, uh, goes into production, currently scheduled for the first half of twenty twenty six, so it's still two years away, is targeted uh, at a starting price of about forty five thousand uh, dollars, with a three hundred mile range. Um, it'll come in single motor rear wheel drive, dual motor all wheel drive and three motor all wheel drive variants with a zero to 60 time of less than three seconds, which is just, I don't think you fast. want a truck that can go that no. fast. In fact, didn't, didn't uh, one of the actors in succession drive his truck into a restaurant? He just <laughs> got the new Rivian and he did. Uh, yes. I think he yeah, under, the, he underestimated um, the acceleration. The older brother uh, yeah. whose name I'm blanking Connor. on right now. Con Connor, always, yes. always was the, interested the in politics from a him. young age, but apparently can't drive his Rivian very well. Drove it. No. He, he's fine. I think everybody's fine. Although the pizza yeah. restaurant suffered a bit of a ding. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. But that's, but that's the thing is you don't, why do you have acceleration like that in a truck? That's a really good question. Um, I'm still trying to figure that one out. You know, it, it started, it started with Tesla. You know, they wanted to demonstrate to the world that, EVs are, you know, they don't have to be appliances. They can be ex sexy, They're exciting super fun. vehicles. But all e yeah. EVs have good acceleration. They have right. full torque from the get-go, which gives them a nice 
peppy pickup. You know, I love even in my in my less exciting EV sitting next to somebody in a in a muscle car at a light and just gently going away while they're shifting then they get the gas engine going it takes them a little while to kind of get up to speed um but we don't need zero to 60 in three seconds that's crazy no we, we don't that's and, ludicrous you know, I, mode and, I, right? and i've written about this you yeah. know on multiple occasions that, it's dangerous you know, i think it, manufacturers have proven okay yes evs are faster than internal combustion vehicles like they're ridiculously fast yeah the point has been made we all know this now stop please yeah. we, yeah. we don't need to have mainstream vehicles that can go this fast it's it is dangerous um and most people most drivers don't have the skills to handle a, a vehicle with that kind of performance so we should just Stop. You know, it's like five seconds, zero to 60 is plenty fast enough for anybody that will let you merge into any you know gap in the freeway as you're getting on the freeway uh, or make, you know, pass on a two lane road, whatever you need to do without being just stupidly fast. Uh, you know, I mean, growing up, you know, I, I remember when, you know, anything under 10 seconds, zero to 60 was considered really fast. And now, you know, we're talking two and three seconds, zero to 60 times. It's, it's more than enough. It's yeah. time to move on. Um, but, um, you know, so this, the, the, the R2 is a, is a two row um, crossover, two row SUV. Uh, like I say, about the size of a four door Wrangler. Uh, and it's built on an all new platform. Uh, but they then, you know, uh, RJ Skinner, the, uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Rivian, uh, pulled a, 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 one, a one more thing. Uh, and he showed off this, which is the R3, uh, which is an even smaller EV based on the same uh, same platform. It's about five inches shorter. Uh, so it's roughly, you know, similar size to like a VW Golf um, and uh, really, really cute, you know, compact hatchback um, that uh, I think, you know, could do really well. And we don't know when this one is going to go into production. And to be honest, you know, beyond what the, the dates that they announced for the R2, we don't really know when or even if that one's going to make it into production because the problem that Rivian has, like a lot of other automotive startups, especially EV startups, is they're not making money. Um, and, you know, one of the other thing that came out of the the news on Thursday, in addition to revealing these new vehicles, the R2 and the R3, um, is that Rivian has been uh, working on building a, a second assembly plant in Georgia. They, their first assembly plant is in Illinois, uh, where they bought uh, a, a closed assembly plant that was formerly owned by Mitsubishi. They're building a second plant in Georgia. They um, have revealed that they have paused production on that plant or construction on that plant. Um, and they don't know when they're going to resume. Basically, they're trying to save on the money because um, <laughs> they've been burning through about $4 billion a year. Um, and right now they have a little less than $8 billion left in the bank. Uh, and at $4 billion a year, if they don't get to profitability or at least break even, then they could be out of money in two years, which is about the time that the R2 is supposed to arrive. Yikes. So. Um, that you know, would that make you reluctant survive. to buy one of these because of the you know the the risk that the company won't be there to back it up? Yeah, it certainly would for me. Yeah, um, you know, because you're making a big investment, you know, an R1, you know, which is the only product they have right now, starts at you know $75,000. And you know, if I'm putting spending that much money on a product, I want to know that whoever is building it is going to be around for the long run mm -hmm. to support that, that there's going to be parts available and, and other things. You know, most most people do not have the financial resources to be able to just say, eh, OK, my seventy five thousand dollar car, my hundred thousand dollar car uh, no longer works. You know, it's, yeah. it's obsolete now. It's one thing, you know, when your phone stops working, stops getting updates. When your car is, is no longer supported, that's a little bit of a different story. That's why I bought a and Fisker, because I want. <laughs> <laughs> you saw the story. Marquez Brownlee panned the yeah. Fisker, probably rightly so, um, for bad software. In fact, my uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend who uh, uh, Oscar winner who. Uh, he and his wife drove the Fisker up to the Academy Awards some years ago. It was the original Fisker, not the Ocean. And um, they couldn't get out. It wouldn't out. be Steve, would it? 
No, it was a different, oh. uh, different uh, Oscar winner. Uh, and I don't want to name names, but uh, you know, him. and uh, but they couldn't get out of the car because the software <laughs> was broken, which is somewhat embarrassing oh when you're driving up to the red carpet. Uh, so I knew, and this was years ago. I knew that the Fisker uh, might have uh, buggy software, but. That really, that really hurt them when Brownlee uh, panned them. I think they tanked the stock. In fact, I think it put the company in well, jeopardy. Well, the stock was already in the tank before <laughs> Marquez ever got his hands on that yeah. car. Um, but know, it, but like, it tanked the company, didn't it? I mean, it's there and now. Different no, difficulties. well, I mean, it, it was. It was whether already Marquez tanking. had that had did that <laughs> video or not. It was it was already tanking. It was already in trouble. Um, yeah. you know, like like most of the companies that went public in 2021, 22 through SPAC transactions. Their stock price is down, I think, something about 98% from the peak. Um, and, and that includes Rivian. You know, Rivian is among those. They Rivian didn't actually do a SPAC. They did a traditional IPO. But, you know, their stock is in the tank compared to the peak that it hit after they went public. Um, most of the other companies that have done, that did that are in a similar situation. And... Um, and Fisker's had a lot of issues with production, with getting getting parts, uh, distribution, uh, and you know I spoke with with Henrik Fisker back in January at CES, um, you know when they were announcing that they were um, they were dropping their original plan to do company owned stores and sell direct to consumers like Tesla does, and going with a traditional dealer model, because it turns out that. Um, you know, if you have a lot of, you, you, it takes a lot of money to set up your own stores and your own service yeah. network. Uh, you got to buy the, you know, buy or lease the, the land, set up the facilities. Um, and that's a really expensive proposition, you know, whereas with traditional automakers, you know, with franchise dealers, the dealers are the, you know, they're independent businesses. They're the ones making that investment. Right. So you're selling the, you know, they're selling the vehicles to the dealers at a wholesale price. Uh, which hopefully is still profitable for the automaker, but then they don't have to make that investment in all the service and retail and support um, directly. The dealers are are making that investment, which, and that which comes out of their end. Brings us to you haven't been on since Apple canceled its uh, mm -hmm. rumored car project. We should say rumors say they yes. canceled their rumored <laughs> car project. Although I think the rumors are pretty credible. Well, the car project was not rumor. It was well, was they never real. announced it. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. We know it was yes. real, but they never announced it. Um, and probably for similar reasons, it's a it's a big deal to get into the car mm -hmm. business from scratch. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most automakers have at best upper single digit profit margins. There's there's a couple like Porsche and Ferrari that managed to crack the 20 percent mar profit margin. Apple's uh, region, typically but, 40 to 45 percent for its other products. Right. Which is why I was always skeptical that Apple would ever actually move forward and produce a vehicle and, and sell it uh, because there's just it it's not possible to make those kind of margins um, in the car business. It's just, it's too competitive. There's, there's too many players and um, you, you can't sell vehicles. If you, if you want to be a, a mainstream product, which is what Apple does. I mean, you know, they, they produce products, high volume products. Um, you know, you're never going to be more than a niche player at those kinds of price points. You know, if you want to sell, hundreds of thousands to millions of vehicles a year, you cannot, you know, you cannot sell them at the kind of price points and margins that Apple is used to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we talked about this last week on Twit, you know, at some length, but, you know, it was, it was never likely to be a, a successful endeavor for Apple. Well, I wish you had told Tim Cook that before he invested a billion dollars <laughs> well, a year for the last 10 years. You know, I, I did write that in early 2015 when <laughs> oh, you he tried. If he, if he had been reading my blog, yeah. <laughs> he would have known this. And yeah. he could have pulled the plug back in 2015. They were thinking they were going to have to sell it for 100000 The other thing, and you were on Twit uh, when you said this uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, they decided they weren't going to be able to reach level five autonomy. You right. said something which was kind of shocking to me. Level five means a car can drive itself in any condition, whether it's seen the road or not, uh, without any human intervention. You said you don't think we'll ever get to level five. I, I, and most of the people that I know of that that are you know in the business of 
trying to develop automated driving systems, don't believe that we will ever get to level five autonomy. Interesting. In um, your lifetime or is, in all lifetimes? Well, you can't Perhaps predict ever. a thousand Certainly years not, from no. now. No, 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 no. Yeah, I don't mean I a mean, thousand years from now. I'm saying like e even in the next hundred years. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't like to project out right. beyond about well, you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, but certainly in the next 10, 15 years, um, we will, we are extremely unlikely to get to level five autonomy. Uh, that, and that, like you said, that's a vehicle that is capable of driving under any conditions on any roads, um, without human intervention. You know, what we have today is level four, which is, driving without human intervention or supervision, but within some limited operating domain, like, you know, say the city limits of San Francisco, um, you know, or only operating in daylight hours. As in Waymo or so, GM's crews. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, you know, the, 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 the constraints can be anything that you set, you know, whatever the capabilities are. Well, but furthermore, within some limiting limit. Yeah. Furthermore, we've learned subsequently, certainly with GM and, and probably with Waymo, there is a driver back at the home office who takes over if it gets in a situation it can't handle. And there's some evidence that that happens more often than one would like to admit, or certainly than the companies would like to admit. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they have uh, staff that are monitoring these vehicles while they're in operation. <clears throat> it's kind of like playing, uh, uh, you know, it, a Gran Turismo. You've got a steering wheel and pedals back at the home office. Do they drive it like that? Um, in some cases, yes. Um, I don't think that's that a, that's that's not what uh, what Cruz and and Waymo and most others are doing. But oh, there okay. are there have been companies that have done it that way. Um, in in most cases, what they're doing is you know the vehicle is designed to be able to operate without that human supervision. But when it gets into a situation it doesn't know how to handle, then it's intended to pull itself over to a safe place, pull itself to a safe stop ah, somewhere, okay. and call back for help. And then the, whoever's supervising it can give it some hints as to what to do. So if there's a construction zone and it's not quite sure how it should maneuver around, then rather than trying to drive it directly remotely, which can be problematic, especially in something like a city because of the, the latency involved in the communications, uh, is what it will what the the remote operator, the teleoperator will do is give it some hints and say, okay, you're allowed to we're going to let you cross this double yellow line here, which normally you can't cross to go around this obstruction, you know, or make a U-turn here. So and just go a little amendment the of the rules. Although yeah. this, this story from CNBC back in November, uh, after Cruz went out of, effectively went out of the self-driving car business, they kind of got a little more honest. CNBC said, Cruz confirms robo-taxis rely on human assistance every four to five miles. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Even if <laughs> yes, they're just saying you can cross that double yellow line, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. and so that gives you some idea. Yeah. And that was that was their attempt at level five. No, it was level four. That was, was also level, level four. Five. Okay. Yeah, because because it's limited in where in what geographic locations it can operate in. Sometimes it's limited by say weather conditions or or other criteria. So there is nobody that was actually working on a level five system. Interesting. Nominally, you know, Tesla is supposedly doing that, but the reality is, you know, that that what they have will never actually be capable of level five operation because they don't even have anything to keep the sensors clean. Right. Um, and the only sensors they use are cameras. You know, I was so, impressed. I, 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 you kind of agreed that I should get the BMW i5. I mm -hmm. ordered it when they first announced it and you said, no, that's going to be nice. Uh, and you've driven it since and confirmed. But uh, the other day it said the camera is a little smudged. Do you want me to clean it? I said, yeah. You can clean and it. And it went, and uh, the camera got clean. That's cool. Yeah. So it's got little windshield wipers. I don't know how it's working. That's neat. Well, it's, it's use, if, if it's if it's the forward, you know, the the main camera that's up by your mirror. Yeah. You know, that can be cleaned by your your main windshield wipers. Oh, um, but okay. there's there's also other cameras. There's a camera on the front, um, in the front fascia, in the yeah. grill area. Another one in the back. And they have their own separate washers. It's so cool. Um, that's neat. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you were going to do any kind of automated driving, that's essential. Yeah. You know, it's you, weird you that Cruise didn't. You have to keep those, those cameras clean. Yeah. No, Cruise, Cruise had sensor uh, cleaning systems. Oh, they did. Oh, okay. Yes. I you said and they did. as does Waymo oh, okay. and, uh, and every other company that is serious about this. The yeah. only one that doesn't? Tesla. 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 Yeah. 
That's the one that doesn't. Sam Abul Samad, Principal Researcher, Guidehouse Insights. It's always fun to talk to Sam. Mm -hmm. I learn yeah, so I learn much. something so, every time. So John John Ashley sent me a question from right. uh, a viewer. Oh, let's do uh, it. Do you want do you yes. want to do that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should I read so, the question or should you? Go, go ahead, ahead and you read do the it. question. Okay. Go ahead and read the question and then I'll I'll give you an Where answer. is that question? From? <laughs> oh, I was <laughs> Or I can read it. I have yeah, it open here. Yeah, you read it because uh, I okay. shouldn't have volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so this came in from uh, from Trent. Uh, he sent it in to uh, to Twit, and um, and it says uh, so. I have a three body problem. A few years back, my wife and I picked up a travel trailer. We go love to go camping, but have hit that age where setting up a tent or even a tra tent trailer is no longer fun. I can sympathize with that. Uh, anyway, we we also picked up a truck to tow the trailer. But with gas prices as high as they are in Canada, uh, it costing $800, uh, $800 a month at the low end and sometimes over $1,200 a month during camping season just in fuel costs. Oh. I have a friend who says to sell the truck by an older, cheaper tow vehicle, but also keep an older, inexpensive car to drive around when not towing a trailer. But I'm trying to cut the hydrocarbon cord and would love to get an electric vehicle. Trouble is, there's only a handful of vehicles that can tow a 6,000-pound trailer. Uh, the Ford Lightning, the upcoming Chevy Silverado EV, the Hummer, and the Rivian, and also the, the Tesla Cybertruck. Um, but those are kind of expensive, and my friend who loves his old cars says they're cutting production of both the Lightning and Silverado for, he claims, build quality reasons. So that's not entirely true. Um, Ford did reduce production of the Lightning, but not for quality reasons, but rather just because of demand, to, you know, trying to match production with demand. Uh, Silverado, on the other hand, they've had some manufacturing issues with the battery modules. Um, so they haven't cut production. They just haven't been able to ramp it up yet. Um, and then the third body of this problem is I'm not exactly flush with cash. The former option is the most affordable, uh, that being uh, to buy an older tow vehicle up front, uh, but means we're still at the mercy of big oil. Uh, to be able to afford the second plan, the EV, we'd, love, we'd have to look at leasing a Lightning, but is that even worthwhile? Yes, there's the whole issue of ownership, but the value of our current truck has more than halved since we picked it up three or four years ago. So there seems to be very little value to ownership anyway. Uh, our EV trucks really as bad as my car snob friend says, um, is leasing a viable option to get into EVs. Um, help me. Uh, you're my only hope. <laughs> so here's the deal. Um, the, the EV, uh, EV trucks are a viable option in terms of their capability to tow a 6,000 or more, or more pound trailer. You know, you can tow 10 or 10,000 pounds of the lightning 11, uh, with the Rivian or the, uh, the, um, the, um, cyber truck, the Hummer is only about 7,200 pounds. Um, so you can tow, but the problem as you no doubt, as Trent has no doubt noticed is that when you hook up a big, heavy travel trailer to the back of any vehicle that you're towing with, uh, your fuel economy or your energy efficiency goes way, way down typically by at least half. So whether it's a gas vehicle, um, you know, if you're getting 20 miles per gallon with that truck, you're going to get 10 with that trailer, um, typically. The same is also true for an electric one. That And that's where the problem uh, comes in. You can tow that weight with an electric truck, but your range, instead of being 300 miles, might be 150 miles. Or depending on the shape and size of the trailer uh, and the, how much aerodynamic drag you get, could be even less. There, you know, some tests with a Lightning towing a big travel trailer have seen range as low as 100 miles. Uh, so that's the, that's why if your primary reason for having the truck is to tow a big camper trailer, don't buy an electric truck. You know, the, the electric trucks are great at everything else. Um, they're as good as a gas truck you know, for payload and, and, and every other use case, except for long distance towing. And if you're, you know, doing $1,200 a month during camping season, I'm guessing you're towing that trailer long distances. Um, and because of the way charging stations are set up right now, in most cases, you don't have a pull through charging like you do at a gas station where you can pull up, fill it up. You know, you, you ha would have to, in many cases, disconnect your trailer every time you stop to charge, you know, pull up to the charger. Uh, it's going to be a real hassle. That's You're going to have to do it frequently. Um, so don't buy an electric truck if your primary use case is long distance towing. That said... Um, I would actually agree with the friend who says to sell, 
Well, if if the if the the resale value of your existing truck is um, is already half of what you paid for it, actually don't sell it. Just keep it because the older, cheaper tow vehicle is probably going to use as much or more gas to do the same job. So just keep the truck you have. But um, for the less expensive vehicle to drive on a daily basis, um, buy an EV for that. Um, you know, so I would strong, you know, I mean, if what you want is just a, a you know daily runabout to get around town, think about getting a used Chevy Bolt. Um, or Nissan Leaf, you know, those vehicles will probably meet all your needs and you can probably buy a used Bolt or a Leaf for $15,000, uh, you know, maybe even maybe even less in some cases. Stay away from the first generation Leafs, the, the shorter range ones, because those, they have issues with the battery degrading, but every every other EV is fine. Uh, but yeah, consider buying a used, a used uh, Chevy Bolt and keep your existing truck. That would be my recommendation. Is the Chevy Bolt discontinued? Yes, it went out of production. They ended production in December. Didn't they change their mind and then change? What I th there is, they are, they are going to bring <laughs> the Bolt confused. back. They are in, bringing it back. In 2025, okay. yeah. Okay. But um, so the the Bolt that they built up until last December was based on older technology for the motor and the battery. So they're bringing back the Bolt uh, EUV. Uh, they say in 2025, probably later in 2025. Um, and it's going to use uh, newer motors from their Altium platform. They're more efficient. And also um, an LFP, a lithium iron phosphate battery pack, um, which will be less expensive. Uh, and so hopefully at that point, you know, they'll at least be able to get to break even, if not profitable with that vehicle. So it is coming back, but it's not available. You can you can actually buy still buy new bolts right now. There are so, still bolts available on some dealer lots. So if you want to buy a new one, you can you can we get a really good bolt. deal on a bolt. We love our bolt. It was a great. We yeah. got it for a very very good deal. It was the least expensive EV out there, uh, mm -hmm. and with the uh, seventy five hundred dollar tax break, I think it ended up being like twenty grand. And uh, I know uh, Anthony Nielsen just bought an EUV, and he's very happy with it. So I I was yeah. sad when I heard they were going to discontinue it, and I'm glad that they have decided to uh, make it again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think nice Trent uh, sounds like Trent. Yeah, Trent's in Canada. Um, so, you know, they have different tax breaks. I don't know if they have, uh, what, what the Here's tax weird break would one. be on a bolt, but that would be my recommendation. Here's my tip. Uh, lease it. Uh, so I was, we were going to, I was going to buy the, uh, I-5 outright cause that's my last car. Cause I'm an old guy. And I thought, well, I'll probably keep this 10, 15 years. And by then I shouldn't be driving. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the, the salesman said, well, if you lease it, so the, so the BMW is assembled in Germany, not eligible for the $7,500 tax credit. You have to be made in the U.S. He said, if you lease it, uh, there is a $7,500 fleet. Fleet, yep. Lease. Yeah, the, same the, the commercial this, vehicle actually. tax credit. And if you lease, it's it falls, it, it actually falls under that commercial vehicle transaction um, it's part of the uh, call that Inflation a Reduction a Act. Loophole? A, so, and by loophole? the way, I'm not yeah. running the fleet. I got one. Yeah. Yeah. But, I guess I, but it's still it's still a commercial transaction because what's happening is the manufacturer is selling it to the leasing company, the bank, or their their finance arm. Ah, um, and and then they so are so it does get it sold. You. Okay, I get it. It does get it does fleet. get sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that and, makes sense. And so and okay. so you know manufacturers, you know, for because for the IRA tax credits now the vehicle has to be built uh, final assembly in North America, right. in U.S., Canada, or Mexico, and the battery has to have a certain percentage of uh, North American content or or content from fleet free trade uh, partner right, countries. Right. And so um, I'm not I against five, any of that. I think that's good to yeah, incent yeah. manufacturers. Yeah. To, and to so the I-5, since US. it's built in Germany, right. doesn't qualify for that. But if you if you lease it, you can get that. And the that, same is true for vehicles built in Korea and Japan. There were enough discounts um, on it between that and the friends and family because Lisa owns a mini. That he said, well, it's going to cost you the same whether you lease it or buy it. So might as well lease yeah. it. And then if you decide yeah, to buy it at the end, at the end of the end lease, of the term, you can buy it out. And it's the same price. And, and, and thought, in fact, well, um, hmm. recently uh, it, it's come out that there are some uh, some companies uh, that are doing um, special lease agreements. So basically you lease the vehicle. So you get the $7,500 that's passed through on the, the lease terms. 
And then, you know, typically, you know, on a lease, you know, at the end of the lease term, you know, at the end of 36 months or 24 months or whatever the lease term is, you have the option to buy the vehicle. Well, what they're doing now is on some of these EVs, they are they're telling customers that um, if you have the option, you know, uh, to buy it after two months, so lease it for two months. And then at the end, at any time after two months, you can buy out the lease. So oh. if you wanted to buy it, oh. you know, I don't know if BMW is doing check that, with that. But That's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. Sam, we have taken way too much of your day. I hope you're going to have a wonderful uh, day and uh, we will see you in a month and we'll see you sooner than that. I hope on Twit. Sam will say yeah. principal researcher, right. got house insights. Of course you can hear him every week on the wheel bearings podcast and your colleague. There's a fresh episode up now. We Yay. talk about the, the Rivian R2 and R3 and, and also uh, charging uh, a Ford Mustang Mach-E and an Infiniti G80 at Tesla Superchargers, they, which they, is now possible. They, I guess they had a run on the NAX adapters at Ford. Everybody, mm -hmm. if I still had a Mach-E, I would have gotten it, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Although, no, I have to say, in the so three you, years I had that Mach-E, I only used a supercharger or an external charger of any kind, like twice. Once on a road trip to, to Carmel and once just to see how it worked. <laughs> Yeah, most of the and time the I just charge for, it at home. Most people, most, yeah. most people charge at home, yeah. which is the most economical way to do it. Absolutely. The DC fast charging can be expensive. Uh, but if you own uh, a Ford EV, either a Lightning, uh, an E-Transit or the, uh, the Mach-E, um, you can go to Ford.com slash fast charging adapters. Um, and you between now and the end of June, you can go on there and you put in the VIN number of your, your vehicle and they will send you a free adapter. Amazing. After that time, after after June, don't it'll wait. cost you two hundred and thirty yeah, bucks for the don't adapter. Wait. Don't wait, yeah, yeah. Get Thank it now. you, Sam. Samable salmon, so always jam packed with information. Have a great right, day. See you guys Sam. next time. Thank you. Bye -bye. We're going right, to take bye -bye. some more of your calls in just a bit. You're watching Ask the Tech Guys. That's Micah Sargent. I'm some guy in a suit. <laughs> uh, our show today brought to you by Wix Studio. Uh, I only have a minute to tell you about Wix Studio. I wish I had more because this. By the way, I've been. See, I'm going to take more than a minute now. <laughs> I've been going to Wix to look at all the stuff you could do with Studio, and I am blown away. The Wix Studio is the web platform for agencies and enterprises. I'm actually really looking about, maybe I should just move my blog over there. There are a few things you could do from start to finish, a minute or less now, on Wix Studio. Adapt your designs for every device with responsive AI. Ever amazing! Expand Wix Studio's pre-made solutions with back-end and front-end APIs. Sky's the limit. Generate code and troubleshoot bugs with a built-in AI code assistant. Switch up the styling of hundreds of web pages. That means fonts, layouts, colors, all in a click. Add no-code animations and gradient backgrounds right in the editor. Start a design library. Package your code and UI in reusable full-stack apps. Oh, and one more big one. Deliver everything to your client in one smooth handover. Time's up, but the list keeps going. Step into Wix Studio and see for yourself. I was blown away. Go to Wix.com slash studio. Click on the link on the show page to find out more. Wix.com slash studio. Uh, you know, it's funny because in the early days of web design, every site looked the same because it was like cookie cutter websites. Now with Wix, every site is unique and a perfect little snowflake. And it's it, and amazing. Okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was over uh, 60 seconds. Um, you're going to watch the Academy Awards tonight? No. Okay. Then I won't ask you who you're picking for the best picture. Who are you picking for the best picture? I'm not going to say. Oh, come on. Well, everybody oh, knows. You don't jinx it? Everybody knows Oppenheimer's going to win. Oh. Everybody knows but that. But you want the the dead The I poor things horse, was the really horse. really uh, amazing. And I think Emma Stone should definitely win best actress. But that's just me. Uh, who should we talk to next? Uh, I'm going to pick up on Melissa. Oh, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Star six to unmute Hey, yourself. Leo. You got Jamie out of Tampa, Florida. How you doing, sir? Ah, uh, great. Is it James or Jamie? It's Jamie. I, I called about the antenna a couple, a couple weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, hi, Jamie. Welcome. Thank you, Leo. Michael, how you guys doing today? Uh, We're huh? great. Doing well, thank How you. did the antenna solution work out? Well, so I went to... Um, this is the guy, by the way, pool. who had a, one of those flat panel antennas. It worked better 
when the wire <laughs> was out exposed than when the <laughs> antenna was out, which tells me that the wire was the antenna. So go ahead. So, um, on the on the advice that you gave me, Leo, uh -oh. I went to uh, TVFool.com, yes. and it's, 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 probably, it's, probably, it's probably it's probably gonna go down again in about fifteen it, seconds. It, it, it is. They must <laughs> be running that server on spit and twine because yeah, as soon as I mention it, every time, boom. Okay. Right. So I went to TV Fool, and it said that I, it, it told me because I put in my address, and it told me I guess it, I guess it also tells you what kind of antenna you need. Right. And what stations you can pick up with it. Right. And so um, I live about 17 miles away from the towers. And it, all the stations seem to be coming from one general direction. Which is good news because you can and, aim an antenna at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so um, it told me that I needed, that it told me it, it recommended a Mohu Leaf antenna. It's called that because it's, Literally, this thing is like thin and flexible, yeah. like a leaf. It's a good antenna, yeah. So, mm -hmm, I bought one of those. It's actually hanging up on the wall, almost toward the to my bedroom ceiling right now, as, um, as we're speaking right now. And it's actually right near. It's actually I if I if I had to give you an, an accurate measurement, I'd say it's about. Oh goodness, I'd say about maybe three inches away from my bedroom window. Yeah. And. Uh, it's coming, and all the stations are coming in except for one, and that's the CBS affiliate down here. But then again, their signal is so weak that you could sneeze and they'll go out. So. <laughs> yeah, an indoor antenna is never going to be as good as one you could put on the roof. You, we don't want to put one on the roof in lightning country, obviously. So, uh, but I'm pleased yeah, that you could get all but that weak station. That's pretty impressive. Is that better than you were getting before yeah, get the with the wire on the floor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah, exactly. And not yeah. only that, but that's one less wire for me to trip over and now, stuff. So did you there's get, that. Did you get the right. Mohu in gray tweed? Yeah, that's the one I got. <laughs> that's you know, it's not as ugly. You know, you could put that on the wall, and people might think, "Well, that's some sort of weird, interesting the, light fixture that, or something." Interesting little thing. Exactly. Yeah. They won't know what it is, but I know exactly what it is. Yeah. So, Leah, one of the, one of the, I, I do have a general question for you, and it's about all these streaming services that I'm actually going to be dropping because oh, we're going to correct that on password sharing translation. Right. Uh, translation, Daddy needs a new yacht. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, what I that's think. right. I think you're right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So the so so my question is, um, I keep hearing oh, broadcast TV is dying. Broadcast TV is in decline because everybody wants to go on Netflix or Hulu, or whatever. Is that, I mean, I mean, what, 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 what is they're still very like profitable. I think that's really propaganda from the mm -hmm. broadcasters who say, gee, we don't make enough money with advertising and charging you. Mm -hmm. uh, w w we need more. Mm -hmm. And they probably want tax cuts or FCC, some sort of FCC loophole. I don't think they're dying. I think they're doing just fine. But I do think. Uh, there will come a day, not in the near future, but there will come a day where they stop broadcasting and they just do it all over the top of the internet. But they will, but they yeah, as yeah, entities uh, will continue to exist. You're 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 going to get your thirty dollars out of your Mohu. You're going to get your thirty dollars worth. I guarantee you, it's going to be years before those broadcast signals go away, if ever. You know where? If, here's if, where if, I would here is where I would remind you. They're trying to kill AM radio, right? It's not it doesn't come in many cars anymore. Yeah. And and all of a sudden, Congress yeah. and the broadcasters for AM radio, <laughs> everybody are saying, "No, save mm -hmm. AM radio." That it's that's just AM radio, to... which is really economically anyway not feasible. It is dying. Broadcast television is here to stay. Your Mohu is going to get nice strong signals forever, and the best signals. Yeah, you yeah, can that, get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, especially because the streaming services they keep, they keep, you, you keep saying, "Oh, well, yeah, we're going to raise prices. We're going to crack is, on passwords." This is free and and, and, and it's and, good quality. Yeah, this is good. How, do you do you have uh, ATSC three in uh, Tampa yet? We do on a few of our channels, except for I don't have that kind of. I don't, you know, I just had to. You need to get a whole new setup kind of for that. And by the way, one of the things mm -hmm. that's a little disappointing that that potentially could have given you a 4K broadcast signal, but most of the time, broadcasters are just using that extra bandwidth to just slice up their signal and give you, you know, 
Matt right, Matt right, Lock, right. Twenty-four and, hour Matlock right. reruns on on, <laughs> on channels and stuff. Yeah, I have a I have a friend. I have a friend that has uh, that has antennas, and that's all she has is antennas and free service. She doesn't pay for Netflix or nice. Hulu. Because um, uh, she told me she said she thinks that in the near future they're going to start charging us resubscription fees, like cable does. They can't. Not, no, like, so, like, if you want to, no, no, it, I it think could. you're safe. They, how, how, how would, would they, they charge you? Yeah. No, uh, no, the streaming services like Netflix. Oh, they might. Is oh. what I'm referring to. Oh, yeah, they might. Yeah, the yeah the Hulu. Yeah, e, 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 um, uh, yeah. So the fear is that she has it. My friend has it. They might charge you Netflix or Disney Plus or whoever might charge you a resubscription fee. So let's say you cancel, you see. know, you and cancel then cancel after say, watching a show, and then you go back. Then they say, okay, it's ten dollars, but it's also two dollars because you just left. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a big right. problem and for them is this churn where somebody watches Succession, it's over, and then they mm -hmm. go, well, I'm going to cancel my subscription until Game of Thrones comes back. I, that would like be an that. interesting choice. I think the pro the thing is it's already built into the prices. This yeah, is why so. they raised the prices in yeah. the first place yeah. is because of churn. And so you've In other words, that. Daddy's got his new yacht. Yeah, Daddy's got his new yacht. Yeah, he's already <laughs> got his new yacht. Um, that would yeah, be. He's got, yeah, he's got his new yacht. He's got a Lamborghini. Yeah, and that's, that, all, yeah, that's all. He needs a Lambo to go with the yacht. I and mean, they they also, I mean, exactly. that's factored into the price too, right? They they have the churners who are factored in. They say, okay, we have these people who are consistent and they're standard, but we know when time a new show comes out, we're going to make a lot of money right. in the moment. And so, yeah, I I would I would eat. A uh, a fondant hat <laughs> if if they started charging resubscription fees on Netflix. Ooh, that sounds so, tasty. Yeah, I'm not going to eat and a real hat. And the fast hat, services but. are fine though. The fat the, the fast services like Pluto and and, and Tubi are doing. I mean, they're they're beating me. Well, free, everybody free is starting to. Fit. Yeah. So this is interesting. You know, we've talked about this before. I think we talked about it with, with you, Jamie. Which is, uh, we're in a uh, transition time between. The old school three channels on a TV set through a giant antenna on the roof to over the top streaming. And it, 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 all sorts of different models are being tried out. Ad supported. Netflix is doing it. Amazon Prime just added ads to theirs. So, I mean, I, I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation. We're in a, uh, a time of great change. Isn't that how, like, some movies begin? Like, it was a time of, of great, great change. change. That's how Shogun begins. Yep, that's, that, yeah. that's usually how they do it. It was a but time of great... Though, so we're in that time <laughs> right now. It right, was, right. And Pluto, Pluto and Tubi are kicking butt, though. Pluto, I agree. Tubi, I think for guys. a lot of people, there is there are there. good free streaming over-the-top services uh, that, you know, if you're willing to watch some ads, and usually the ads are not that bad. Uh, they don't do as many no, units per hour. And stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, a pleasure talking to you, Jamie. Right, I'm glad right. that that... Uh, Yes. Mohu Leaf worked. And you know what? By the way, I went to TV Fool as soon as you mentioned it. They were down. Big white page. Holy crap. Like deja you broke it. Again. You <laughs> broke it, my friend. <laughs> TVFool.com. Oh, Don't go now. Go later. Guys. Go later. You'll be able to really get on there. Thank you, Jamie. Great to talk to you. You're yeah. watching Ask the no Tech problem. Guys, Leo Laporte, Micah Sargent, and senior producer John Ashley. Um, Look at this. This is TV Fool. Oh. I feel like. <laughs> what have you done? I feel like they must go, oh, gosh, darn it. Leo mentioned it again. <laughs> Not I must go. You know, it's got to be running in somebody's back, you know, yard or something. It can't be a very good server. Can you put the uh, Discord in the lower uh, monitor, John? Uh, uh, I think it's Leo's hair cam right now. And uh, they gave me a hairbrush oh, camera so I could brush my hair. My hair. Well, and uh, just I, press the, I'm not your he's got the button right there. Watch. He's got the button. See, look at this. He's going to push it, and there it goes to the disc. It's a magic button. Um, what else should we do, John? I was just stalling for you, John Ash. Oh, well, I didn't Should know. I do this? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Amateur. What is it? Uh, the amateurs will never have. It's the other email. That amateurs will never have. prosper. Yes. yes. I think. <laughs> On planes. On planes. <laughs> jet lag. Am jet lag is for amateurs. We got I got it. <laughs> okay. So this comes from Fred. He says, uh, long time listener. That was six wow. O's. No, eight O's. First time emailer. I love your show and have for many years. Thank you, Fred. Also a Club Twit member. Woo! I know that, Fred, because I, I recognize your name. I saw something I don't understand. I cannot find out about 
by doing some Google searches. That's when they call us. Yes, when yes. the Google searches fail you. We're post Google. <laughs> Uh, I was trying to install a free software package on my Mac mini mm -hmm. to make bootable thumb drives. And I hit a snag. I fell for one of those click to download traps. Oh no. Uh, and had to uninstall all the junk I just installed. What he's saying is a lot of times when you go to these download sites, they have a special downloader mm -hmm. that downloads a bunch of other stuff besides the, the simple one that you, that you want to get. I decided to have a look around the various arrears of the Mac to see if I had any left uh, had left any software fragments thereof by mistake. Mm. Here's what I found under login items. I tried in vain to find out how to delete the Tatiana. Oh, that's a good name. Item from the list, but could not figure it out. Let's look. Here's the uh, login items. Uh, open it, login. These items. Oh, my. Allowing the uh, NI hardware agent, NI host. And then here's, um, oh, this is the one. Tatiana Livinskaya. Hello. Hello, Tatiana. My name is Livinskaya. Tatiana Livinskaya, yeah. and uh, I would like to live inside you. <laughs> so, what are you, what are you gonna do about that, Tatiana? So, let me see. Let me go back to his. Uh, he gave us another picture too, didn't he? Uh, let me go back to his email and see. Uh, while writing this item, I looked at the list about a week later, and the Tatiana item is gone. I tried in vain to find out how to delete it. Uh, I asked a friend of mine who was a Mac developer if he knew how to delete it. He did not. He also told me he has a similar item in his list, a person's name. Yeah, okay. So it disappeared. We can talk about it. What is it? So Apple made a change um, to the way, it's a security change to macOS. And in making the change, there were some more requirements put in place for developers to uh, sort of have blessed software on the platform. And depending on how the person's Apple account, their developer account was set up, or if they didn't have a developer account, if they worked with Apple to get the proper blessing that exists outside, it's called a credential. If they used their name, ah. then the developer's name would show up in the uh, login items page. And there were complaints because it does make people feel a little well, especially concerned. Because you, yeah, you, you see this name. And so for me, um, I don't have it on this computer, but I use uh, a tool on my Mac Studio that ch that lets me set when Time Machine runs instead of having it oh, run on its own. Nice. Yeah. And this tool is from a developer, and so their name, let's just say it's uh, Ted... Uh, Ted Lasso. Ted, Ted Lasso, thank you. Yeah. And so Ted Lasso shows up in mine. And if yeah. you didn't know what that was, that'd be a problem. Now, the reason why it disappeared is because you did properly, or it sounds like at, as much as you could, uh, properly uninstall the tool. And so when you restarted your computer and macOS went to look in the system slash library slash startup items folder, it could no longer find that launch daemon or that launch agent or launch daemon uh, or launch agent. And so it removed that from the list. That's why you didn't see it there anymore. Uh, I do want to give you another little tip. Uh, there is a tool called Balena, B-A-L-E-N-A, -E Etcher. And Love that. That's the one I use. Yeah, yeah. Belina Etcher is a fantastic tool that and that's free. is tried and trusted by all yeah. of us, open source, yeah. uh, that lets you create those. Uh, you were trying, what was it, on an SD card that they were trying to do or a flash yeah. drive? I can't remember what And it may be for all we know what he was trying to download, but don't go to those download sites to get these tools. Correct. Go to the manufacturer's or creator's site. In this case, it's etcher.belina.io, E T C H E R, like etching. Uh, you know, a stone. Belina is like the, I don't know, B-A-L-E-N-A -E dot I-O. And you can download it for free from there. Etcher Belina. Very nice tool. And if you get it from there, you won't get the additional Tatiana live in sky, I live exactly. inside you stuff. Exactly. Because you don't want that. And honestly, there shouldn't have necessarily been a launch agent for a tool that is making bootable drives in the first place. That's not. I think Belina Etcher is portable in the sense that you could put it on a USB key and run it from the yep, USB that is key. True. It doesn't do anything to your system, which is exact. I mean, this is simple enough. Uh, Windows users should use Rufus. Does the same thing. Also portable. Also free. <sighs> Great question. Yeah. And glad we could help. Yeah. And someday we'll find out who Tavins, Tatiana <laughs> Live Inside you is and uh, make sure it doesn't ever happen again to anybody. It's interesting that it disappeared. I just think that that's because they removed it properly. So when they restarted, 
Uh, OS restart forward and it was it. gone. Yeah, yeah, restart maybe would do it. Yeah, that's sense. That's sensible. Uh, all right. What do we want to do now? Uh, how about a, a voice? I, I, I see a guy in the Zoom who's really a good looking fella. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, is that's it, me. Is it you? Oh, it's you. <laughs> Never mind. Is it, uh, is it New Angel Garrett? Oh, yes. We can do that too. Yeah. Should I do Because we haven't done uh, a Zoom yet. We haven't done a Zoom. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll think about it. I got it. I just pushed the button. It's pretty easy. We do see something, some, we do see some blocking uh, the, folks who are uh, regulars and we're, we're trying to get some. Yeah, we want some in. fresh blood. So if you're a yeah. regular and you're wondering what's yeah. going on, that's we got why. Jamie on by accident because you thought she was Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie does that caller ID. Yeah, you can't trust it. What's your name? What's okay. your first name? Hi, I'm Garrett from Erie, Pennsylvania. Hi, Garrett. Hi, Garrett. I told you before, uh, Garrett. I have a funeral plot in Erie. The family uh, we grew up. Uh, my family comes from Erie distantly, and there's a apparently a. A family plot there, so I might be visiting you, not too soon. Hopefully, no time soon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah seriously, Lord. What's up, Garrett? Yeah. Well, um, well, first of all, I I was the first call for help caller, I believe, on the new screensavers. Uh, so oh, many, many wonderful! Years ago. So good to see you again. I'm so sad about that show. Back. I thought if we brought the screensavers back, it would be a hit. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't. I guess people just. It was too much of a TV show instead of a podcast, I think. And people just didn't pick it up didn't on click. it. I was very disappointed. I, you know, really had high hopes for that. Anyway, Slightly thank you for calling audiences. it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a little inside well, baseball, but that's something exactly. happens. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> um, so today I have what I think is, I feel like it's kind of a dumb question because I am a career long IT pro, Twit listener since 2008. I feel like I should know the answer to this, but uh, it's something that's been confusing me, so I'm sure I can't be the only one. Okay. Uh, Google has talked about killing off support for cookies because they want to switch to their new ad platform. You probably heard Steve talk about it. Steve was singing yes. its praises, which I'm not sure right. I agree and with. And it sounds wonderful, and yeah. I'm excited for that. Yeah. But does I don't removing trust cookies... <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Uh, but does removing cookies from the Chrome browser mean removing all no. cookies like how do i no, log no, no, into no. websites no third party okay. cookies it's third party okay. yeah so so that's this is a good opportunity garrett to kind of explain this because yep. we throw these words around cookies were originated originally created by the folks at uh, uh mozilla or netscape the idea they the real name for it is persistent client side state information i thought i thought they should have called it pixies oh p-i-c yeah. but but if but the name actually is much more descriptive. Persistent client side. That means on your computer, not on the server. State information. What's state information? As an IT guy, you'll know this. Coders know this as well. State is something. A saved game is your state. You save the state of your visit to a website in between visits. That's most useful. You just described it for logging in. When you go to Facebook, you don't log in every time because Facebook saves a cookie, a persistent client-side state information, little bit of information on your hard drive that says you are Garrett. And then when, face, when you log into Facebook, Facebook checks that cookie and says, oh, it's Garrett, he's back. Let him in. That's a, what we call a first-party cookie. That is... Facebook can read cookies it sets. And there's a very clear rule in cookies, which to this day is still well enforced, that a site can only read the cookies that it sets. Facebook can't read Twitter's cookies, nor can Twitter read Facebook's cookies. That's good for privacy. But it didn't take long for ad agencies and various nefarious actors uh, on, the, on the web to figure out a way around that first party cookie restriction. And I think Facebook actually was the first to do it. Remember the like button on Facebook? Bing! Bing! Well, the like button, it's on a web page. Let's say it's on your Starbucks web page. But it's a little window into Facebook land. And that like button can set a Facebook cookie even when you're on a Starbucks page and can read that Facebook cookie. Now imagine you put a like button from Facebook on a Starbucks page and on a Pete's Coffee page. Well, in effect, Facebook can see you visited both 
because it has a little Facebook window, that like button on both pages. And that's what we call a third party cookie. It isn't really, it's truthfully, it's still a first party cookie in the sense that it's, it's Facebook. But it looks like a third party cookie from your point of view because you think you're visiting Starbucks or Pete's Coffee. You're not visiting Facebook. And by the way, you don't have to click that like button to have that cookie. That's just by being there gives Facebook access to the cookies in that visit. So that's a, that's a really nefarious trick that, that advertisers use and use, is one of the reasons you see the proliferation of these kinds of little likes and things uh, on, on all over the web. And they can even do it without showing you anything. Uh, uh, what our advertisers call them a tracking pixel. And we don't do it because we don't like it. But that, but there are tracking pixels. And as a uh, IT guy, you probably know how to look at the developer page uh, on any site, and you can see plenty of tracking pixels there from third-party sites. Google uses it for analytics, for instance. Whenever you go to a site, our site, for instance, we use Google Analytics. There's a hidden little thing there that when you load that site, it sends information to Google, which processes it and gives us analytics about who visited the site and stuff. Well, Google's getting that information too. That's a third party cookie. So Google realized after a while, even though they participate in this ecosystem, some might say foster this ecosystem, they could see that people like you, Garrett, were getting mad as hell and weren't going to take it anymore. <laughs> and the rise of third party ad blockers like our recommended ad blocker, uBlock Origin, really has contributed to this. Cory Doctorow calls ad blockers the largest consumer boycott in history. So many people, almost 50% now of people who use the internet use ad blockers of some kind. So many people use ad blockers that breaks this whole system. Your ad blocker can say, yeah, no, no third-party cookies. So eventually browsers put in a switch for third-party cookies. But Google thought, you know, we could look really good if we would just ban them entirely. Now, it's only from Chrome and Chrome derivatives if they decide to pick it up. Unknown whether Edge, for instance, from Microsoft, uh, Brave probably won't pick it up. But so various Chromium, um, uh, you know, th uh, web browsers that are based on Google's Chrome may or may not turn this feature on. I think that, in the long run. That was run, another. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was another concern, though, because so many uh, third party browsers these days are Chromium derivatives. Right. So, yeah. Well, and eventually Google influences the ecosystem dramatically, if only yeah. because they can say, as they did with HTTPS, you know, we're, we're going to rank you better if you do what we say. Mm -hmm. And since Google search is so dominant, there's another reason, another strong argument against having a dominant search engine. Uh, Google is so willing to use its clout in search to get people to do other things. Now, I think it was probably a good thing to say, well, sites should use HTTPS, but who are they to decide that, right? They're not, they're a private company. And so they're in, you know, unilaterally deciding this on third party cookies. They've replaced it. And you may remember if you've listened to Security Now, you follow this all along. We sometimes mention it's kind of in, it's kind of tricky technically, but they've tried to replace it with a variety of other ways of less intrusively finding out what you want to see in ads because advertisers really want to know that without giving away your information. And they've come up with a system that Steve said is is good at protecting your privacy, but does give advertisers the information. And in a nutshell, this system. Uh, as you browse around, your browser locally starts to collect a list of things you're interested in and can offer that when you visit a website to the website, which can then pick which ads to show you without without knowing anything about you. It resets it periodically. There's all sorts of additional features that make it perhaps more palatable to consumers. Don't be fooled, though. Google's only doing this because they have to. They don't want to do this. In fact, you know, all these companies would prefer that you just let them know everything about you. Uh, but they realize if they don't do it, people are going to start using more ad blockers and more technology, and that's going to kill the ad ecosystem. Uh, it's going to kill Google, which gets almost 90% of its revenue from ads. Google's an ad company. Google is not a search company. They they give you things like Gmail and search to so that you'll see their ads. They're an ad company. So they want to preserve this whole market without uh, get, and, and keep you from getting too upset. I'm not a huge fan, Garrett. I think, does that explain everything that you, 
I know it's kind of a technical thing, but I think people should understand this. And then, of course, you got the EU, which completely misunderstood it and puts up this banner, not for third party cookies, but for any cookies saying, yeah, this site uses cookies. Of course it does. <laughs> Trust me, right. delete all your cookies, then go out and surf. You have it's to re-enter all your passwords. It, it's a, it's a, it's, cookies are fine. And cookies as designed are fine. It's just this little trick of putting the thumbs up button or whatever. Uh, tracking that's, pixels. that's perfect. That's basically the answer I was looking for. That's the answer I expected even. Uh, it's, for me, this is what's embarrassing is, is I have, and I work with uh, a, a, web developer who is just strictly, you know, he knows, he knows how to write PHP. He is not a tech guy in the least. So when he comes to me and says, Chrome is going to disable cookies. How do I log people into my new website? I, I honestly had to pause and say, no, I think they're disabling third party cookies. So you'll be okay. But I, I wanted to clarify. So yeah. I appreciate all of that. Yeah. You remember, you may remember topics and flock and all of the Fuck. other, yeah. yeah, all of the other things that Google tried to replace third-party cookies with. Well, they've come up with one. They're going to implement it in Chrome. Uh, it's not like we get a vote. Um, I don't use Chrome. Right. I don't, and uh, uh, you know, I I will only use if I use a Chromium-based browser, it'll be de-Googled. Um, I don't use Google Search anymore. Uh, I actually pay for a third-party search called Kagi K A G I because I don't. I really feel like Google is evil. At this point, I hate to say it because I really they used to be this great company, but they're an ad based. They're an ad company and uh, and their interests are not your interests, in my opinion. But the good news is cookies live on until Google decides not. <laughs> right. Right. There. When you have 90 percent of the browser market. Right. What is their what is their market share? It's very high. I don't know if it's 90, but they have a dominant position. In, they can dictate. They they own search and they own browsers. They own the web. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not right. It's one of the reasons, you know, I use Firefox. It's one of the reasons I recommend people, uh, you know, de-Google their life. I don't use Gmail anymore. I don't use Google calendars or contacts. I use Fastmail, our sponsors, calendars and uh, contacts. So even if even if the web is surveillance-based, if you spread it out, you're better off. And Google just has way too much power. I'm seeing 65 to 66% yeah. of the overall yeah. browser market. And I think that's, that's higher in uh, some jurisdictions than others. And it, it's dominant. Uh, Firefox is basically being put out of business mm -hmm. in the long run. And I think that's what's going to happen. If you said, which, what is the percentage of Chromium based browsers? That's got to be well yeah. over 90%, well over, right? So I hope you can now explain it. Uh, I hope I explain it well enough that you can explain it to your developer friend and tell Perfect. them to stop I using PHP. It. That's a crappy one. <laughs> <laughs> there we oh, go. I'm kidding. Perfect. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, All right. Thank you. Take thanks, care. Micah. Thanks. Lee. Yeah, I have been uh, uh, our Miami coffee addict. Uh, Micah has been asking uh, what browser I use. And uh, on Mac, I use Arc, which is a Chromium derived browser. And I probably should go back to Firefox. I want to support Firefox. I, I use Safari regularly and Firefox is my go-to when it needs something that doesn't work in Safari. Yeah. And Safari's good. Yeah. I don't I don't have any problem with what Apple's doing. I do think, honestly though, and my position on this has changed gradually over time, that these companies have gotten so big and so greedy. It's really important to remember that their interests don't coincide with your interests. They kind of used to, you know, they were, they were like, oh, you know, our customer really matters. They're not even pretending that anymore. Yeah. Um, they, they're in the business. They're in business to make money. I was watching last week uh, tonight with John Oliver. He's talking about airplanes. I, we were going to, we're going on an airplane tomorrow, a Boeing right. <laughs> airplane oh, wait, on like Alaska one, Airlines tomorrow. One of the ones that lost the wheels. Shh, shh. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and, and, and Lisa wants to watch John Oliver, which is about airplanes. I said, I don't think we should watch this. I said, I don't think yeah, we should watch that's, this. I agree with you. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get Lisa on the airplane tomorrow after watching. No, it. you watched it anyway. Yeah. Boeing is not a good, another good player, but it's again, it's the example of how these companies, Boeing was engineering driven, very high quality company. They merged with McDonnell Douglas. They became very profit focused. All of a sudden it's what's our stock price doing? Not are we making the best airplanes we can make? Mm -hmm. And as a result, people die. And uh, and I think this is, you know, people don't die because of Google 
<laughs> but but the but we got we gotta we gotta stand up to these guys and say, hey, no, no, wait a minute, we're over here. We're your users and we are the most important part of your business. And please don't kill us. I agree. With, I agree. With you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It's like if you haven't seen it, uh, don't see it before you go on an air, a flight. And I'm gonna just gonna have to nudge Lisa onto the plane. It's not a <laughs> it's moving. not a max, thanks goodness. Keep moving. But it is a seven thirty seven uh Seven thirty-seven. Um, you want to do any uh, voicemail? Yeah, yeah. Eight 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 seven two four two eight eight four during the week. Calling from Fallbrook, California. Hi, Mac Fallbrook. In the way north of San Diego. Yes. Question: A while back, you had recommended the Artifact News Aggregator as a great replacement for the Google News, which I've really fallen in love with. Artifact has really been quite a bit better. However, I just received notice from them that they are going to shut down their service at the end of February. Yeah, isn't that awful? So question, what's the next alternative? What's better than Google News can actually um, let you adjust some of the topics instead of ignoring what you say, et cetera. What's next, guys? Right, that's a great question. I'm currently using a tool on iOS uh, called Bulletin. Oh, I'll have to check that uh, out. Bulletin is an AI news reader that it does a few things that I like. One is that it kind of avoids it. Well, it doesn't avoid it. If you are browsing and it comes across a kind of clickbaity headline, it will use AI to read the article and just the article and make sure that the headline isn't just, you won't believe what happens if you click on these three buttons on your Mac, it will change it to say clicking these three buttons does blah, 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 blah. Um, it is, the, it has the built-in functionality for saying, yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. And it has uh, a feature that I like where in the morning it will give you kind of your day's rundown of news in a little readable paragraph or two and in the evening, the same thing. Um, one thing about it is it's still pretty early days for the tool. Um, and so they are still kind of ironing out some of the bugs that exist. So that's, one place where it depends on how kind of I use a lot of software a lot of the time and a lot of it's in beta. And so I have a little bit more patience for that. If you find that you're not patient for bugs from time to time, this may not be the tool for you. Uh, but what's great about it is it's also just an RSS reader. So you can put in your own custom RSS feeds uh, that you want to have and have information for that as well. Artifact was created by Kevin Systrom who started Instagram, very talented developer. He went to Facebook when they bought Instagram, left after a few years of suffering and uh, said, I want to redo the next thing. And he, you know, there was, as far as I could tell, really no way to make money <laughs> the way he designed it. He had enough money. He could do that. You see that a lot. Uh, Artifact had, a, was not only a news reader, an aggregator, but also had commenting and had social features. I thought it was a really good idea. I was very sad. This is the, if you go to artifact.news, this is what you see now. Um, so I guess uh, they failed, I guess is what you say. Um, have you tried Flipboard? Do you have an opinion on Flipboard? Because Mike McHugh started Flipboard. <laughs> Yeah, I really like I mean, Mike and I, and I really, uh, he's a fan mm -hmm. and I think he's done a, you know, Flipboard has been around forever. Exactly. It's been around for a long, and they've long time. pivoted. They originally were Twitter fed. So Twitter, you would f go to Flipboard, create an account, set it up with your Twitter feed. And then it would give you a magazine based on news that your Twitter, the people you were following on Twitter were uh, tweeting and that really worked well because mm -hmm. you had in effect human aggregators creating your magazine for you it's become more of um i would say more of a magazine they they turned off twitter aggregation of right. course uh it's become more of a i don't know it's more of a newsreader than it was i mean i think there's a lot there's a it's good um this I, is what it looks like i'll, yes, I'll show you sure. so people can See, you've had Mike on uh, Tech News Weekly, I think, as uh, I remember. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, can are you? Do you not have the over the shoulder shot? Maybe, maybe we don't. Oh, there it is. Okay. So you see, it is kind of magazine-y, right? You see, yeah, it it's flips. Very cool. It flips <laughs> exactly. And you've got these photos and everything, which is nice. Um, I think though, the thing about it has also comments, which is kind of what people liked about uh, Artifact. I think was the social uh, element. That's true. Yeah. I thought though that Artifact was 
clean and simple. This is not I, that. Yeah, this is different. You, you get to the stuff faster. Yeah. And Flipboard is definitely, it's interactive and it's fun to use. But if you want that more clean look, then Flipboard might not be for you. But again, well, one good thing about Flipboard is all of the integrations that it offers. And they continue to, you know, make sure that it works across so many different uh, different ways of, of getting content out there. So the reason we liked Artifact uh, just as you said, is we, we go through a lot of news. This is part of our job, your job with Tech News Weekly, my job with all of the stuff we do mm -hmm. is to keep up on tech news. So we go through a lot of news. So we don't want pictures. Right. We and, don't want fluff. And the, the animation that's a we flip to take as we, long as it does. Give me the facts, man. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. So I will show you what I use uh, on the on the web, which I kind of like, uh, is this is this is to, uh, to me what a newsreader should be. Uh, this is called Sumi News, S-U-M-I dot N-E-W-S. And I actually pay for this. Um, and this just aggregates. I can follow as many different news sources as I want, including newsletters. You see, I quite follow quite a few. And then when I go to Sumi dot news, and you have to, I think it's five bucks a month, you pay for it. But when I go to uh, the news, where, where's my news? $22 a I think I just broke it. Twenty-two dollars a year. It's not bad. It's some some guy. It's not a it's not a big uh, company. There it is. Um, I will see what you and I both want because we are not. We're looking for just yeah, the facts, I just man. Want the fa exactly. So this has the headline from every source I follow plus a, just a short paragraph, which is enough for me to see if I want to then click the link and go to the site. And then you know decide whether I'm going to include it in our uh, bookmarks. God, remember Google Reader. <sighs> yeah. This is kind of to me. This is a, this is an RSS reader. It's very simple. Um, so it really depends. I you know it depends on what you what you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, we provided a few options depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, a fun, interactive, and visual experience Flipboard, um, an AI based uh, system that has some bugs. That's where uh, now I forgot Bulletin, and then a very clean, very easy to digest option is Sumi News. And I use uh, Sumi News uh, on the uh, on the iPhone because it's so clean and simple. It's you don't you know you just create a Sumi News uh, uh, desktop link. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So you it's just it goes to the web, but you you use right. the little save it to my uh, home page. Right. Or did I have an app? I can't. I, I think that's that's how it works. Uh, anyway, um, SUMI is assuming. No, I guess maybe it's. I don't know. If yeah, it's it is. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. It's it's a it's a PW, it's what they call PWI but... progressive web app. Yeah. All right. There's your answer. That was a great question. Always like to talk about how we get our news. Indeed. And that is a constantly shifting thing. Do you use Apple News at all? I do actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I have it as part of my yeah, I pay for it subscription. So, yeah. Um, Google News. I tend to use Google News a lot. I also use. <laughs> it's funny. I also use Google News. Uh, Apple News is where I go when I actually do want to kind of see visuals and and sort of dig in that way. And also whenever I go to a page and it's uh, behind a paywall. Usually it's it's available through Apple News because of Apple News' own partnerships. That's the one advantage. The disadvantage of Apple News for me is I can't easily share Apple News stories. Yes, exactly. Stories. If you yeah. share them with somebody who doesn't have uh, Apple it's News dopey. or an iPhone, then yeah. they can't. Yeah. And then, yeah, Google News, I think, does a better job of minute-to-minute uh, breaking news updates. And so the, the news feels more topical on Google News yeah. than on Apple News. You know, it's, you know. It's all uh, over the place. Horses for courses, I think, is how they might say that on BritBox. <laughs> um, we got time for, um, should I, do I need to do a phantom break here? I no, we did one. Uh, did we not do one? I did, I did read the ads, but is there a phantom oh, break? Oh, a pause that refreshes, uh, I yes. I forgot about the pause that refreshes. We should probably do that right okay. now. Okay, I can never remember. <sighs> You're watching Ask the Tech Guys, Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte. Let's continue on with... Another voicemail? Oh, you got another voicemail? Fun. Okay. We got a lot of... Hi, Leo things. and Micah. This is Mike from Niagara Falls. Hi, Mike. Um, Niagara I'm just wondering Falls. if it's possible to use the Rode Smart Lab Plus during a video call or a phone call on Android because it seems to mute the audio coming from the phone. Thank you. Ooh, I wish I, this is one I could have had beforehand. <laughs> um, road, so. so road, which makes, by the way, uh, low cost budget microphones and other stuff actually is pretty good. 
Um, my son, who does, you know, those great TikTok videos where sound is very important, uses a Rode shotgun mic on his camera to get that chopping sound. I, a lot of people use the Rode podcaster microphone. So they have a, what they call a lavalier, which is a lapel-based mm -hmm. microphone. And most of the Rode mics are uh, either designed to connect to cameras via uh, either USB or a phono plug. Uh, but then there are row mics like the podcaster that are USB designed to plug right into your laptop. I'm going to guess the lav is a USB. The smart lav plus is actually just a standard headphone jack uh, okay. spot. So in that case, there's no reason why it should be muting your audio it, because it should be treating. Well, it, as if you, okay, I know what's happening. If you plug it in, is it treating it as a to an audio phones? jack? which is obviously not any modern phone, but if you have an audio jack in your phone and you plug it in, it is going to mute the speakers, assuming that you're plugging in a headset. Oh, I see. So it's, I see. I thought that what he was saying was it was muting his voice through the microphone. But yeah, if it's muting- I think that's what he's saying. Yeah, okay. Know. What you're saying makes sense. It's, yes. It And it probably also thinks, right, that it's not just a microphone, but that it also has- uh, headphones as well. So it's piping it's the audio headset. out through. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that might be the issue here is that you're trying to use a simple microphone device and you need to have speakers as well as part of it. Huh? Wow. Double cookie pop-up box on road. I guess they do a lot of European business. Um, $79. It would sound probably fairly good knowing roads stuff. Uh, it's an omnidirectional. That would be something I would recommend against sometimes. Uh, for a lav, that makes sense. But uh, omnidirectional means it's going to pick up a lot of room noise and stuff. If they had a USB one, you might be Yeah, that would be off. better off. Um, yeah, I don't, um, yeah, I don't think you can do this, <laughs> is what it boils down to, um, just by plugging it in. Yeah. It, you're right that it's almost certainly pi trying to pipe out audio at the same time and there's nowhere to pipe it out. Uh, and I guess if you plug it into your computer, if, if you're on a Mac and you plug it into your computer, you would be able to go to the sound control panel and change yep. output and input are separate. Yeah. So you could change the output to the Mac speakers and the input to uh, the road. Yeah, on and a I computer, think Windows would fine. let you do that. It's just a phone that you'd have that issue, right? Yep. Yeah, because it thinks you have uh, earphones. Now, one way to solve this would be to get an adapter that would have an earphone plug. Yeah, you could do that. So you need an adapter. This is a uh, the, this is what we call tip ring sleeve. So it's got three lines on it. So you'd need, and that's, by the way, why your phone thinks you've got ears. Because uh, it's it's saying, I have ears. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what that, yeah, exactly. See the three bands? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they intended for, as you can see with this picture, recording, not mm -hmm. for phone calls. So if you got an adapter, and I'm sure they make them, I'll have to look and see, that would take tip ring sleeve in and have an output for headphones, and then would have a single plug, so it would look like a, a tripod, a single plug that goes into your phone, then you could split the microphone input and the output for the uh, headphones. Uh, I'm sure there is such a thing. If I look at Amazon, I'm sure I could find something similar. So that would be the only way you could use that is with an adapter. Yep. Agreed. Let me look for tip ring sleeve adapters. I love, I've always liked saying that. Tip ring sleeve. Tip ring sleeve. It sounds like... Splitter. The they do make such a thing. of a British clock uh, engineer... Hello, I'm Tippering Sleeve. <laughs> I will work on your grandfather yes, clock. all the time. Uh, audio splitter. And that's for, a lot of these are for splitting audio so that two people can listen to the same headphone jack. I don't think that's what you want. I'm sure Cable Matters makes something of the sort. You want something that the, with, with two inputs, one for headphones and one for a microphone, and then a single output. Oh, goes. Rode makes it actually makes something called the Mobile Interview Kit. Oh, there you go. And it has That's what it does. headphone jack in the middle, and then two places to plug in microphone lavalier microphones if you wanted to. It's called the 
Rode Mobile Interview Kit. I'm going to show you that on the screen right now. It's for dual lavaliers. It's specifically designed for their products. And this one, it's interesting, has a lightning port Yeah, on I'm it. seeing that. So that's they for iOS, one, but I'm sure they have down, a USB one yeah, as well. Yeah, looks like they're, keep going on the left there, that thing. Compact audio interface. That looks like it would be. Learn more. Two microphones. And, oh, great, an error. Whoops. While you're here, why not go somewhere else? Okay, thanks very much. So if you're on an iPhone, this would be your solution for sure. Uh, I'm sure you're not because you're plugging that Rode Lav into the phone. So yeah. you're on some other. So I was able to get to the AI Micro. Um, oh, it is a little pricey though because it is a full on interfa interface. It's $80. That's... Yeah, it's doing more stuff. How about this? This is from uh, one of our uh, chatters. Ah, Tipring Sleeve has an answer for us. Is his name Tipring no. Sleeve? <laughs> Hello, Tipring. Uh, this is the 3M 3.5 millimeter audio cable. I don't know if this Wait, is Wait, that's what just you a cable, want. yeah. Yeah. But thank you for the <laughs> Thanks useless. for the link. Thank you Skinny Elephant Hershey, <laughs> if that's your real name. <laughs> let's take one more. Should we do a call or uh let let's do one more email to round it out. Oh, I like that. Yeah. This will be email a triple email day, out. one of the first. Bitwarden and application credentials from Rob in Golden, Colorado, home of course. Many of us use a password manager, Micah and Leo. He says your name. Oh. Do you add Micah's name on here just to, ever? Oh. I don't. You wouldn't do that. Many of us use a password manager to log on to web applications via a browser extension. Moi OC. One of the features that originally attracted me to LastPass is the ability to also fill out credentials. Ah, when opening a local desktop application such as Quicken for Windows, when I asked the photos to Bitwarden over a year ago, they did not support that feature. Uh, I don't think they do to this day. So do you're running the Bitwarden standalone app. I'm always cutting and pasting. Yeah. I don't uh, think I, I mean, well, so f how would they even, yeah, I, I don't, don't even know how they would do that. You would have that. to watch what you were doing constantly to be able to suggest. I do, I am able to autofill um, my password and username after the fact with stuff that's on the desktop running the desktop app that I use. Um, but as far as for it to be aware of when you were using an app and trying to sign up for that app, I don't think you could do that without having constant screen recording. Which going. means whatever you were doing is, is, you Being know, ingested. Yeah. And this is always, you know, this is always an issue I wouldn't on Mac that. when it says, well, you've got to turn on complete control of your system to yeah. use this. Accessibility and all of Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like wouldn't, that. I don't think that's a good idea. So, so I don't believe Bitwarden will do that. No. Uh, I don't know what will do that. I, do, I was going to say, I've not heard of a password manager that does do that. And, Rob, I think it's our advice not to Not to that. let anyone do that. Because that manager would then really there is, be watching everything. There is one tool out there that does anything that's close to that. And it, it doesn't do that. It just watches what you do all day and then uses AI to give you uh, kind of a review of what you did during the day. And again, not something I recommend. Not a good idea. Here from StarTech, thank you, Adasync, in our you, Discord, Adisync. is the, the tripod solution I was thinking of. This plug plugs into the phone. One has a microphone. One has a headphone. Uh, this is from StarTech, $12.99. But there, there's got to be many people who make yeah, this Yeah, I'm thing. sure. Yeah. Once this you know what problem. to call it, that's Splitter. what you Splitter. Yeah, you just yeah. need to know what the problem is. Yeah. Um. Okay. I could do one more. One more email? Why not? This one's a complicated one. Oh. How how confident do you feel? I Leo I'm and always Micah confident. From Heather. My husband and I are traveling to Vietnam and Cambodia soon. We always, it's really nice. Uh, around this time of year, we always start to get people planning their travels. And it's always the same question. Yep. I'm going to guess. I'm Is ready it yet. Gonna about it's going to be about Sims, service. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we both have iPhones and I'm trying to sort out the best approach to phone usage while I'm there. She has AT&T. My husband has T-Mobile. For myself, I'm looking at the International Day Pass versus purchasing a local SIM. So, and then for my husband, I'm trying to sort out T-Mobile's international coverage. You don't have to do anything with T-Mobile uh, unless you want higher speed access. Right. T-Mobile does a pretty good job uh, internationally. That's what I'll be carrying to Mexico. I don't fully understand how all this works. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, if I buy a local SIM, can I send and receive text messages? Yeah, to a new Vietnamese yes, it's number. it's going to be a new number, exactly. 
iMessages will work so if yes. they're not texting your phone. Correct. This and you is that can, problem earlier. You can temporarily register that number with iMessage, but that does cause some headaches at times. She says, I can ask some of my friends here to use WhatsApp, but not all of them. WhatsApp would solve that also. Yeah. Anything it uses to... So this is what we were talking about earlier. This messaging used to use just text messaging, which is phone number based. And then Apple kind of has a hybrid solution, which does both. It will prefer internet based. If it can't do that, then it will go to the phone based. And WhatsApp... Just is all internet based, right? So those are the those are the choices. Um, I'm not sure of all the iPhone settings I need to engage. What you could tell your friends if you did decide to buy a local SIM, I usually don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a modern iPhone, you can have dual SIMs. Yep. If you do have a modern iPhone and you have eSIM capability, then when you get to Vietnam, if you want, you can get a local SIM and keep your old SIM. You'll keep your old number you will continue to receive text messages to that old number, as well as have the new data SIM that you purchased. She wants to use local maps, Google Maps, Apple Maps in Vietnam and Cambodia, internet send and receive text messages, phone calls, go to voicemail. I'll pick up the voicemail when I have Wi-Fi. Smart. Turn off all possibility of data and voice usage. So here's what, here's what I always recommend. Uh, if you're worried about overseas data roaming charges which can really add up turn off data roaming that is possible in any phone no data roaming means you will not get data as you're out and about almost everywhere now certainly in vietnam and cambodia will have wi-fi so your hotel will have wi-fi even a lot of the places you go will have wi-fi restaurants coffee shops etc uh so in that case you'll be fine you won't be using data roaming you'll just be using wi-fi uh, and then if you really do need data out in the country where there's no Wi-Fi, then you probably should get an eSIM, a local eSIM. Or, and we have a number of recommendations yes. from past shows, there are companies that specialize in this. Do you remember? Yeah, I wish I could remember the name. The one app that I always uh, recommend, and let me, I'll be able to find it if I just do a quick search for eSIM. Yeah. Uh, and that's because I've had people who've used it and have good... Um, I've had good experiences with it. I got an email after we talked about that uh, from another company, um, or another user rather, who said he really liked, was it Holofly? Bless I you. I think it was Holofly. I think it was this, Hol Holofly. But this is one company. There are other companies that well. Oh, GigSky well. is the And name. you like GigSky. Yeah, Gig so these Sky. are eSIMs. Again, you need to have a modern iPhone that supports that. That's the last three, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you keep your regular phone number, all of that stuff, but you also add a second SIM for data only. And that will be from a company like either H-O-L-A-F-L-Y or what was the other one? Uh, GigSky, G-I-G-S-K-Y. Or GigSky.com. Uh, so those both companies, what they do is they sell you an eSIM flat rate for every country you might be going to. Let me... You know, you know, you should check and make sure it yeah, supports definitely. Vietnam and Cambodia. I'm sure they do. Uh, yep, Cambodia. And let's see, this is Gig Sky and Vietnam, both supported. The nice thing about these is you don't have to tell them what country you're in. It just does it. Uh, it just works. So, in effect, you're getting data roaming. I haven't tried either one of these. Uh, I'm not going to Europe anytime soon, so. Or, or Asia, although I'd love to go to Vietnam and Cambodia. I'm jealous. Um, do try one of these and let us know. You could also get it in country. I think it's a little more complicated. Plus, the one that works in Vietnam probably won't work in Cambodia and vice versa. It gets a lot more complicated. Maybe try Gig Sky uh, or what was the other one? Hola? Holy Hola, cow? Hola. It's like Ola, I think. <laughs> Ola. Ola. Oh, it probably is Ola, not Hola. <laughs> Yeah, but the H is silent in uh, Spanish anyway. Yeah. So either one of those, uh, and maybe there are others as well. I probably there Ola are. Olaf Fly. Olaf Fly. Olaf Fly. Terrible name. Obviously <laughs> not American. Uh, so that makes it terrible. That makes it bad. <laughs> yeah. They want, they uh, offer it in euros and they also have a WhatsApp number. That starts clearly with not American. Something, there's something weird going on. Let me <laughs> see what the, uh, the the language, and then we can change the currency to dollars and accept dollar dollar bill, yeah, dollar dollar bill, and we can see what the pricing is. But uh, this this looks like the good. I think somebody emailed me and yeah, said this was good. Yeah, someone recommended it to you. Uh, 
where are you traveling next? And then it's uh, it'll give you a price according to your according to your needs. So there's some according to your needs. Is that per month or uh, I think it prepaid sims? Oh, you just buy it and you get a certain amount of data. That's probably what it is. Huh? Yeah, I think that's how Gig Sky works too. It's not that per month. It's not a subscription. So nineteen dollars when you're in Cambodia. Notice that's less than a lot of less than Cameroon. And then it's by day, seven days, $27, 20 days, $54. So this one is by day with unlimited data in Cambodia. So that's a pretty good deal. Uh, $19 for five days unlimited data in Cambodia. That's not bad. Then you then you could go out to Angkor Wat and say, I, don't, I know I'm not going to have Wi-Fi, but I'm going to be able to use my Apple Maps or my Google Maps uh, out, out here. So that's nice. Hey, that's it for our show. Wow. What a fun show this is. I would like to do this again next week, but I can't. Too bad. <laughs> You'll be here all alone. I will be here all alone next week as Leo uh, is on vacay. Getting a tan. Uh, so you will all get to hang out with me, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. We'll also have... Uh, two guests next week as we uh, it's it's that time so I Rod Pyle and Chris Marquardt nice oh that's oh we need some modern photographs if you haven't taken your modern photograph for Chris's photo review next week take a picture that illustrates the idea the concept modern can be with any camera you have doesn't have to be fancy in fact often it's better if it's not upload it to Flickr tag it TG modern and submit it to the tech guy group and Chris is going to pick three to talk about next week i might have time i'm going to find something modern Ooh. and i might have time to submit something i want to i would like to do that i did that last time uh, then i will be back in two weeks uh tanned rested and probably inebriated um so i hope you'll forgive me. you'll be inebriated when you return well you know how those yeah I got those those margaritas can really I was just like it stay takes with a you. while for them to <laughs> No, kick I don't it. drink. I'm not going to be in the <laughs> I'll be completely normal if this is normal. Um, Michael will be back next <laughs> Thursday with Tech News Weekly, Tuesday with iOS Today. Now available in audio to everybody. Yes, it's so, sort of back. <laughs> it's sort of back. Yeah. Video for the club members. And this just gives me a chance to plug Club Twit. We really appreciate all you Club Twit members. You guys have been fantastic. We appreciate your support. It makes a big difference to our bottom line, but we need more. We would like, if we could possibly, to just get one in 20 listeners to subscribe. If we could do that, the sky's the limit. We could do so much more. What do you get? Well, $7 a month. I think it's very affordable. You get all of our shows ad-free. You get video for all the shows that we do, including iOS Today. Additional content from before and after the shows and special events. We're going to do an inside twit when we get back. That'll be one of those additional contents, plus access to our great club twit discord, which is so much fun. Uh, we invite you to join. There's family plans, there's corporate plans, and all you need to do is go to twit.tv slash club twit. You're going to have that great feeling that you're supporting the content that you appreciate. You know, there's uh, something else they get access to if they become club twit members. The Minecraft server? No. I mean, yes, uh, that, but also the opportunity to join us live in person for an upcoming <gasps> This I Week in forgot. Tech. I forgot. So Lisa, our wonderful CEO and my personal wife, has... <laughs> My personal wife <laughs> has agreed to take her day off and come in here and welcome people to our studio. Now, we only can get 14 people per show. We're going to do it for two twits in April. April 7th and April 21st. You must be a Club Twit member. Mm -hmm. If you are a Club Twit member, uh, there's probably something in the Discord. You go to tickets.twit.tv. Oh, you do it on the web. You don't have to yep. be in the Discord. And it's available now. And the way that we'll confirm is that you need to use your email address that you used for Club Twit. That's how yep. we'll know that you are. First come, member. first served. Uh, we missed having an audience. Uh, we will... We will love to see some people in the studio. And thank you, Lisa, for taking in, coming in on our day off to, uh, to do this. Because somebody has to bring you in and all that stuff. And she's tough. She'll, she has to guard us, too. She will take a bullet. Uh, no, she won't. <laughs> yeah, let's not. <laughs> I think it goes the other way. I would, I, anyway, we would love to have you uh, join us. And if it goes well, we'd like to do more of those. Um, it's just one more benefit to being a, a member of uh, Club Twit. It's going to be a lot of fun. I, I, I was talking about the fezes. We're going to bring the fezes out. And I said, how do I clean this? And I got a message from Fezmonger. Oh, nice. Fezmonger watches. 
And he says, you have to hand wash them. But he sent me the instructions. Oh, good. So I will be hand cleaning the fezes so that we can do photo opportunities posing a fez photo in the fezes. opportunity. A fez photo opportunity. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm, I am uh, uh, Leo Laporte, and I will be back in two weeks. <laughs> Tan. And I'll remember my name by then. S tune in for Micah. He's going to do a lot of the shows. You're kind of me this week, which I am, is great. Yes. I'm really, thank Next you. couple of weeks. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. We do uh, the show, Ask the Tech Guys, on Sundays between uh, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mm. Uh, that would be, uh, let's see, 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, or uh, 1800 UTC. God bless you that you can do I that made the UTC conversion in my head, 1800 UTC. We, I say that because you can watch us do it live on YouTube, youtube.com slash A, no, twit. YouTube.com slash twit. If you want to download the shows after the fact, twit.tv slash ATG or techilabs.com. You can subscribe in your favorite podcatcher. You can watch it on YouTube as well. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to Ask the Tech Guys. Thank you so much. Oh, you're right. It's not standard time. It's daylight saving time. <sighs> so I have to go through that all again. 11 a.m. <laughs> to 1 p.m. Pacific daylight, daylight time. time. 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, but it's still 1800 UTC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Have a great week. Bye, bye, -bye. Micah. Bye-bye. Adios, amigos.